Welcome everybody on out to another edition of the Living Dead Wax Podcast. I am your host, Ty, joined by my co-host, Tyler. We got a good one for you tonight. I'll let Tyler introduce it because it was his choice. So, Tyler, how are you doing tonight, my friend? Such a weekend edition. It's That's true, yeah. I had to push this back a little bit uh, from a little kitten experience. But uh, it's doing good. Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm ready to do this. And, yeah, it's going to be a good episode because I picked it. So, obviously, here we are. Uh, everyone knows that uh, every other one picked that one in the, in the YouTube playlist and you'll have a good episode. Um, I should, I should actually really start doing that. I should, I should title things Tyler's pick Ty's pick and then see what actually does better. Uh, so I have a feeling there, Ty, there'll be no different. So <laughs> I have a strong feeling they're going to have about the same views. They always do. And uh, you know, I feel like that's going to happen. Uh, yeah. my, uh, I think either of us are drunk on ego uh, to that extent to, to really assume not yet. Be any different. Not yet. Not, sure, yet. not yet. Yeah, the, the the night is young here with this channel, so that is true. Um, well, we're, we're, brother. we're steadily getting the same amount of views. It's I, steadily yeah. there. Like It hasn't dropped down. So I've been like, I've actually been pretty happy with it. So, all right. You know, appreciate the loyal audience yeah. we've, 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 we've accumulated here. I'm trying to be positive about it. You're just being sarcastic. <laughs> I, I know I like the loyal audience we have. I appreciate the fans. I appreciate you guys. Right. It's really good. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, uh, hopefully you like both our episodes because I think we both slow, do good stuff. Slow and steady. All right. Slow and steady wins the race. Um, true. Yeah. Tonight will be fun. If you are new here, we do talk about music here. Usually, most of the time related to some type of physical media topic. We usually bring show and tell to most episodes. So, if you're into that, you can get that too. Um, but we do a main topic every week where we do a deep dive. So, if you like that, hit the subscribe button, the notification bell, comment down below on the topic of this evening. We'd love to hear from you. So, Tyler, introduce so the topic tonight. Tonight's topic. Yeah, I forgot I didn't do that. Tonight's topic is side projects. So, yeah. uh, favorite bands or maybe you're not favorite bands maybe other guys that did something random that you you didn't like their primary but you like their their secondary which would be really interesting if that's on your list here uh which you yeah. might have some um but uh i think all of mine i'm a big fan of the primary and the secondary I, i'm a big fan of it obviously as well but um yeah, yeah so secondary side projects uh from from you know our favorite artists and uh you know go from there so we'll see what happens yeah, this is actually a really fun one for me to do. Probably the most fun episode that we've done in a long time, honestly. Nice. Being, cool. being 100% legit there for you because I, I rediscovered a lot of things that I have not listened to in a very long time. Okay. Um, so that was that was pretty cool and uh, kind of refreshed my memory on stuff. Now, the way I did this was I tried to – so I'm just going to – I'm going to – Jump the shark here a little bit. I'm going to say I haven't like Audio Slaves, not on my list. Okay. Velvet Revolver, not on my list. Okay. I don't consider them side projects. They are super groups because I do have super groups on here. But There's my point with those, my, my point, with, there is a difference. And my point with those is like during Audio Slave, Soundgarden all, wasn't a thing, Rage mm -hmm. wasn't a thing. So mm -hmm. those, those, that was their project. Yeah. Velvet Revolver, that was same the thing. Mm -hmm. That was their primary. So I did not consider them side projects. They are super groups, not side projects. I do have super groups on here, but they are strictly side projects. Those guys had other bands and they formed one band for a record These are, or two records or whatever it is. They, they, that, was their, that was their day job. We're talking about Moonlights. Moonlight 100%. gigs. There you go. This is what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was looking for. Did you interpret it the same way? I, same way. Same way. Yeah. Bell okay. was not, I didn't pull it. I didn't, I didn't put it on my list. Soundgarden, not cool. obviously. Or not, Audio Slave, not on there. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Same So, gotcha. if, if their band right. ended it, or whatever, it was on hiatus or, you know, whatever the hell happened, they broke up and they had to have a new band, does not qualify. Perfect. Perfect. That's the way I interpreted it as well. So, you usually kick us off. Let's not break precedent here. What you got? If you if you need me to pull something up on YouTube, just let me know. I got it in the bullpen. So uh, that's fair. I appreciate that. All right. So first one. I mean, I'm not gonna lie to you. Like when I really did this, the first thing that came to mind was this side project because this is probably at the end of the day my favorite side project that ever actually happened. Uh, oh, cool. So. Uh, I'm going to start off just the thing. I like everything else too, but like this is the first thing I was ever exposed to like this. So here we are uh, a little band called 
boxcar oh. racer. So uh, this is Tom DeLong from Blink-182 uh, and uh, Travis Barker on drums, uh, David Kennedy on guitar, and uh, it's Antonio, that's not that guy's name, I forget, but it's somebody else on bass. So uh, anyway, um, this is the 2002, I believe, 2002 record. Uh, yeah, 2002 uh, came out. So basically Tom decided that it's on red and black, you know, whatever, uh, marble. So uh, this is also signed. You got the signed edition too. I bought this. I didn't meet Tom. Uh, I have met him, but I did not. I bought this signed. So whatever. Anyway, so uh, Blink uh, had just done uh, Take Off Your Pants and Jacket. Their first kind of like, you know, uh, dipping the toes into the serious stuff. Tom wanted to make a full serious record. And he felt as though he needed to do that outside of the band. So Tom had these songs that he decided he wanted to do the side project with and he uh, pulled Travis in because he couldn't think of a better drummer to use, but the one that was already in his band. So he pulled Travis into the band, which makes sense. The issue is it's a three man band yeah. and you're taking two thirds of the band <laughs> and making a new band, um, which yeah. is an issue. And that's what ultimately this record is the reason why Blink broke up. So uh, if this record never happened, uh, they would have been fine because Mark is on this record. Uh, Mike, Mark is on the, the song Elevator, which is a really cool song. There's a lot of guest stars on here too. I think Tim Armstrong's on here. Davey Havoc, I think, is on here too, if I want to say off the top of my head. Um, but he does a lot of stuff and uh, with different people on here because that was his whole thing. He wanted to figure out, he wanted to write new music and then steer that into Blink. Uh, so this is more of like a post-hardcore emo you know, sound is what he would like was kind of going for um and uh so he uh brought mark in on the song elevator and that was it and so mark took that personally because mark thought if we're going to experiment why don't we experiment with the band i'm not going out myself and doing anything weird travis did other stuff and has always done other stuff but it was just travis travis didn't really involve us in it so the fact that you pulled two-thirds of the band in i'm not cool with and mark never forgot about that and so when this record came out it was a big deal and supposedly uh tom was never going to tour on it and then they tore on it and <laughs> then uh so that was a major issue because then he told mark i'm just putting it out whatever it's not gonna, it's not going to do anything don't worry about it it'll be cool and like we're not going to make it a big deal we're not going to promote it a lot it's going to be a thing they did videos for it they did a tour for it there was a dvd for it like they pushed this thing because blink was huge at the time as well obviously they were they were selling millions of copies of those records so they sold i'm pretty sure this is probably platinum by now um and so Tom kind of broke some like unofficial handshake promises with Mark or whatever. And so Mark took that very personally. And then when they did Untitled, the next record, the next year, um, Mark felt as though he was left out of that progression that Tom did. Because a lot of that Untitled record is from Tom. Um, and I love that's my favorite record they ever did together, ever. And this is probably second. If we're really ranking projects and records here for that whole universe, it's Untitled first and it's this record second every single time. Wow. Um, Oh, absolutely 100 percent. because i like i think those dudes make really great serious music and i love all those other records a lot i have a lot of nostalgia and a lot of connection with a lot of those older songs from enema dude ranch you know uh cheshire you know i love all those songs too but these are the songs that i go to still to this day and uh so uh i feel so it was the first single uh that was a pretty big video that was a really cool song as well um and then they did uh uh, they did, uh, there is, there we go. There is was another one that was a big uh, MySpace AIM song for me. I posted those lyrics many, many, many a times. Uh, they also played it on Letterman. Uh, you know, they, yeah, they promoted pro the shit out of this. And they did multiple videos for the record. Um, so anyway, uh, the whole thing got really kind of out of hand. And uh, there was a rumor that, uh, that Mark saw, supposedly Mark saw some emails that were not supposed to be sent to him. And uh, it was Tom Solo and getting his own deal for a solo record that was more than just this. And so Mark was like, oh, you're going to leave the band. And that's what happened with Untitled. And that was the fight. The whole fight was the fact that Mark was concerned and a little paranoid about Tom leaving the band because he read things he wasn't supposed to read. And that's exactly what happened. So Tom mm. didn't, feel, didn't like the fact that uh, he was being stifled in the band. 
and uh he was he swore up and down it wasn't true he said that's i'm never gonna leave the band don't worry about it whatever and they had a bunch of fights about it and stuff and then they made up and then they you know something else happened and mark brought it back up and then that's why tom left eventually he said i don't want to have these same fights again i can't have the same fights over and over again i'm over it i'm done and then mark, and then tom went out and did angels and airwaves um you know whatever but uh yeah so anyway uh ipso facto boxcar racer really cool record uh i do still listen to this pretty often maybe a couple times you know a few times a year maybe i'll put it on and just listen to it just straight through i love it so much um from the first song there's only one joke song on here uh, my first punk rock song that's the only joke song everything else is very serious and it's a, it's a really cool you know just a cool transition piece uh and you see it and you hear it from take off pants jacket which is a lot of serious stuff they started writing about uh you know the kids um they did reckless abandon all that kind of stuff you know they they kind of progressed a little bit there and then this was the next progression of the serious tone and then obviously untitled was the most serious they ever did with zero joke songs zero fun stuff you know whatever so anyway boxcar racer uh self-titled there you go is that is that signed by tom it is signed by tom yeah okay so i bought this uh Maybe, maybe two, three years ago, he did. Uh, so I think Tom owns these rights or did. Uh, he, we just talked about he sold his rights. But I think Tom yeah. owns this record or owned it for a while or maybe still does. So uh, he'll put out new pressings of this every so often on the web store. And he usually has signed copies and unsigned copies. Okay. So I just this miss run. I think there's five cool. of these, maybe less uh, or whatever. But yeah. I like the cover. I like how it's it's like it's got gloss. Yeah, yeah it's, exactly. It's, yeah. And if you were to feel this, it feels exactly how you think it feels. Like it spray feels paint. Exactly, cool. exactly, 100%. Yeah, I yeah. did at one point in time want this silhouette of the kid running. I wanted this tattoo in the back of my calf. That was a oh, big okay. a big thing that I wanted to do. Uh, the whole way up my calf was just the, the silhouette. So that was a – it never happened. But, yeah, if it's textured, gotcha. it feels really interesting. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, they uh, – 2021 – Tom said there was a song lying around. Yeah. Travis let it out of the bag, I guess. There's a song. Yeah. And then in February 2023, Travis said that song is never going to be released. And uh, it's going to be on the new record. So it's going to be on the new Blink what? record. Yeah. I didn't know that at all. Wow. Tom, yeah, Travis. In February 2023, he said, confirmed on Twitter that it, that song would never be released. A month yeah. a month later, he they announced that it would be released on the forthcoming Blink One Eighty Two album instead. So I guess everybody's in a better place. Like I guess water is under the bridge. Well, that's fair, but also I will say this: so the entire time that Tom was out of the band this this last time, the second yeah. time he was out of the band, uh, the entirety of the five years or six years, whatever it was, Tom would constantly. So the the outs is always Mark and Tom. That's the outs. And they, cause they were the best yeah. of friends for all those years. And then obviously there's a fine line between love and hate. Right. And that's what mm. kind of happened. So they broke apart or whatever. And they never, they've never been close again. Like they're friends now again, you know, whatever, but it was never, it's never going to be like it was before. And Tom would constantly, constantly talk about the entire time he was out of the band. Like I talked to Travis every day. Me and Travis talk all the time. I talk to Travis all the time. And then he'll post on Twitter, like, uh, just found uh, just found this box racer so he did you know whatever originally he's like just found the box racer song at travis barker think we got think we, we could put a new record or whatever or think you know just you make inferences like that and like implications and things and that's why he was out of the band or while he was out of the band so i imagine now that he's back in the band uh the last thing you want to do is bring up old fucking you know issues here and uh maybe start a new riff and uh yeah, you know especially maybe. if you're you're barely back in the band um, you know, so I'm stoked it's gonna get out there, and I guess Mark's gonna be on it. I obviously he's gonna be working on it, so that's that's really yeah. interesting. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. Also released on cassette. So is that an O2 cassette, or did they later do it in cassette? No, it's that's a. Uh, I think I want to say it's a Filipino. There might be one here, but I've seen like uh, Asian copies of it. So that might oh, be wow. an Asian marketplace. Yeah, I don't know how many. I don't know how many cassettes we were cranking out there still in O2. Probably still a, a you know a good amount, but I want to say every time I ever see it, it is a uh, an Asian release. Yeah, no, it's definitely a later uh, later era for sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah, good choice. I've actually never listened to a second of that, so I think wow. I would probably like it. You'd like it a lot, I think. So I when we do the Blink ranking, that will happen. 
Uh, yeah. I would almost, almost, almost want you to just include that in there. Uh, even though it's yeah. not blank, I would almost want you to do it. Uh, but I, I would feel a little disingenuous, but I still think it'd be a thing. Okay. Yeah, we could definitely do it. We could include, I don't know, some of the universe stuff. I don't know, because I know there's a, a lot of Angels and Airways records. So yeah, we don't got to listen to that. <laughs> we can the first record is the best record the second record is okay and pretty okay in at points yeah. the first record is the best record everything else afterwards i don't give a shit about and what's funny we talked this before there are angels and airwaves fans like real ones like ones yeah, yeah. that have really no interest in blink or anything else they have they love angels and airwaves and i think that is crazy uh but it's that's you know eventually that's what happens i guess and you put enough records enough songs out there you know they catch on. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be, yeah, it's, you would think, especially when you're already famous. So yeah. you already kind of have a built in audience anyway. So, yeah. all right. My first one is a big one for me, too. It's one of the first ones I thought of, and that's is the uh, Trapping Wilburys. I knew that. Um, yeah, I mean, pretty obvious choice, but definitely a. A giant super group, definitely a side project all the time. You know, all these guys had other shit and successful solo careers and bands and what have you. Um, so this is, uh, you know, Bob Dylan, Jeff Lynn, Tom Petty, Roy Orbison, George Harrison. Um, and uh, yeah, they got together to do this in and released this in October 88. So this is a couple months before Roy passed away. Um, this is a great record. Uh, <laughs> if you're, I would say if you're into any of these guys, you'd like this record. Yeah. Uh, it showcases everybody really well. Everybody gets their shine. Um, yeah. And I love this record top to bottom. I've listened to it uh, throughout the last week before doing this. And like every song on here is really good. It's a banger. Uh, this is three times platinum. Um, yeah. I, I love it. Uh, Handle with care is a great song. Um, that is a, that's a really good one. That's the, that's the big video with Roy. Yeah as like the ghost in it um because they, they released the video after he passed and uh yeah end of the line that's obviously that's probably the other biggest single on here but uh uh yeah uh there's there's so many good songs in here last night's a fun song uh tweeter and the monkey man that's a good dylan song on there um yeah traveling wheelberries not a big fan of the next record volume three yeah um, I have tried it. I'm a big Roy Mark. I don't think it. I don't think it hurts without Roy on there because they're all so talented. But it's definitely missing, uh, you know, his voice. So I think I always just think about what if. I think that's the, my big thing. If we ever did like what if records, I think that's a big one. Like what if Roy didn't die and they did did, did volume three with Roy or or even kept doing records with Roy. No, so. 100 percent because they all i mean everybody i mean george is the next one to pass away and he passed away in 01 i believe so they still had mm -hmm. if, if roy was the same ish way they still had another you know 12 years yeah and this was a big like roy thing because all these dudes loved roy mm -hmm. so like and this was right around the roy comeback so this is kind of you know jeff lynn's like you know and Tom, especially, like, look at all these guys who respect you, you know. Yeah. I know George, too, because I know the Beatles are big Roy fans. I don't know much about, I don't know if Dylan was, because Dylan was doing shit before. Like, yeah. basically, like, right around, before and right around the same time. So, yeah. there were more contemporaries. But, um, but yeah, Traveling Wilburys, great, great album. If you don't have it, check it out. Um, there's a reissue going around. You can get the reissue of this, too. This is a, this is an older pressing um still has a six dollar and 99 cent sticker on it i did not pay that but there you go there you go so traveling wilburys i uh i have a lot of memories of that record so i went through uh i've talked about this before but i went through uh the cd case um that my parents had and i found that cd and uh nice my mom kayfabe me and so we put it on her, her boom box in her room, which we rarely ever did. But we put it on the boom box in her room because I was also told that boom box was broken for many a year. And it wasn't. I don't know why it wasn't never used, but whatever. <laughs> don't know. So I maybe she just said that. So I wouldn't take it in my room, possibly is probably what happened. But uh, so I found that CD and I had never heard of it or didn't know what anything was going on. I was like maybe like nine or ten, let's say. And uh, so she's like, oh, you never heard about the Traveling Wilburys? And I was like, no, I don't know what this is. She's like, put it on. And so I put it in and I was like, oh, that's cool. And uh, she was like, yeah, you know, uh, Cletus, 
Wilbury and what, uh, what are their names? Uh, uh shit. It's like Cletus. Uh, it's it's I mean, a bunch. It but yeah, they're all. It's all like you know, uh, old timey. You know, uh, back roads yeah, names. Yeah. Um, but yeah, keep going. Uh, I'll, like, I'll get it for you. Yeah, yeah. But she was like, "You never heard about so and so?" She kayfabe me, and so she was like, "You never heard of so and so? You don't know who so and so is? You don't know who that guy is?" But it's all their kayfabe names, right? Or their fake names. Interesting. And so I was like, "No, nah, mom, I don't know what we're talking about." And she was like, "Keep listening. Maybe you'll maybe you'll figure out, you know, who's in the band." And I was like, "Okay." Um, and uh, so eventually, she told me. Uh, and... Nelson Wilbury was George. Otis Wilbury yeah. was Jeff Lynn. Lefty was Orbison. Charlie T was Petty yep. and Lucky was Dylan. There you go. Exactly. And so, uh, yeah. So anyway, so I popped it and I liked it a lot. And then, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I had that CD for a while when I was a little kid and I didn't have really any context reference point beyond that. Obviously I knew Beatles songs, knew Tom Petty songs or whatever. And I knew like maybe some Dylan songs. I probably didn't know consciously any ELO songs at the time. Um, and uh, I probably didn't necessarily know Roy's stuff. I knew it from covers, obviously, as, as time went on. Like I heard sure. you know, Pretty Woman, whatever, Van Halen, and all that stuff. But uh wasn't super, super familiar with anybody. But um, yeah, so anyway, uh, do you know how that record came about? Did you, ever, if you, you know that story, don't you? Uh, you refresh my memory because I remember watching uh, one of the docs. I don't I, know if it's the Petty Doc or it was the Roy Doc that Jeff did. I can't remember. But I ahead. might be butchering the story a little bit. But uh, Harrison was a big ukulele guy, and so him and Petty, he gave Petty a ukulele, and uh, so Petty, so they were they would always like trade back and forth ukuleles and stuff. And then at a certain point, like they wanted to record, and Petty was like, "Let's go to Dylan's studio," and he was like, "What?" And he's like, "Yeah, let's go to Dylan's studio." So they go to Dylan's studio and they're playing and they're going to record whatever they're going to record. And then uh, it kind of just goes from there. And then they kind of, it's one of those things like, I uh, I would like to hear like maybe a Roy voice on here. Let's just call Roy. And they call Roy in and then Jeff produces. Mm. And then so Jeff was on it and then they, that's how it all came together or whatever, I guess. Some form or fashion of that story, I guess, is kind of how it all worked. So it's, so, it's really so, interesting to me that that's how it worked, I worked out a little bit. So Jeff Lynn produced Cloud Nine. Yep, George Harrison. So, so, so they worked on Cloud Nine, and then the first reference of the Trapping Wilburys was a interview with George Harrison on Rockline in 1988. Okay. And he they asked him like, "What are you going to do next?" He's like, "I want to do this group with my friends. We'll call it the Traveling Wilburys." Yeah. Um, according to Jeff Lynn, Harrison introduced the idea of the two of them starting a band together around Ooh. two months into into sessions for Cloud Nine. Okay. Uh, when discussing who the other members might be. Harrison chose Bob Dylan and Lynn chose Roy Orbison. Interesting. Okay. Um, so how does Tom get in? Uh, during his Rockline interview, Harrison voiced his support for Dylan at a time when the Dylan. <laughs> this is at a time when the Dylan was experiencing an artistic, when a time when Dylan was experiencing yeah. an artistic and commercial low point in his career, Harrison yeah. and Lynn became friends with Tom Petty in October 87 when Petty and his band, the heartbreakers toured Europe as Dylan's backing group. Interesting. Okay. All right. You might, you might be right there somewhere. Where's a ukulele then, story in there somewhere. I think I want to, I want to say I, I watched in the world documented about, about George. But then Lynn wrote a lot of uh, Full Moon Fever with okay. Tom. And then he wrote and produced Mystery Girl. So Roy Jeff, Lynn's the, so, Jeff Lynn's the guy. I think Jeff Lynn is basically the, the crux there that ties everybody all together 100%. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and the five musicians well. also bonded over a shared appreciation of the English comedy troupe Monty Python. Oh, yeah. Harrison, who had worked with the members of Monty Python on various productions since the late 70s, particularly appreciated Orbison's gift for impersonation and his ability to cite entire sketches by the troupe. That's funny. I would never picture Roy doing that, but it's funny. Yeah, Harrison <laughs> uh, financed Life of Brian, I believe. That's all because of George Harrison. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, we could talk about also, the Wilbury Trevor. Forever, yeah. Also, side note: one of my favorite stories ever about uh, Python when they did Holy Grail, uh, they were the there. It was a big deal, obviously, in England, and the the press was like uh, they asked, uh, "What's the Terry, uh, the guy, 
the guy, I forget his name now, but uh, they asked him like, what's your next, what are you guys going to do next? And he didn't have any projects on, on his mind. And he was like, we're going to make a move about Jesus. And he was just like, <laughs> that was, he said that because he Never thought it was around. the most controversial thing that he could ever say or whatever. Right. Mm. And then they wrote the, the movie backwards. Basically they had the, they had the, the whole thing, but they had to write it now that they just said it. So it was just a joke and they did it, but yeah, that's fine. Uh, very big one. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, we can talk about real forever because there's so many different little facets there. I want to say that ukulele yeah. story is real on some level. There's it's factored in somewhere. So maybe you'll you probably are right. Yeah. Uh, for anybody out there too, and I need to rewatch them too. There's a really good Roy Orbison doc about Mystery Girl, and they talk about a lot of that. And then I, I in one of the petty docs too, I think they talk about a lot of the Wilbury shit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's the youngest. He's the young cat. He's the young guy in that band. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, and shit, the Dylan's alive. So, <laughs> I mean, Dylan and Jeff are alive. Jeff, I would expect to be alive. I would not expect Tom. And but yeah, yeah. anyway, I mean, they're all pretty no, old, sure. but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Dylan's it's crazy. The worst aware. Yeah. That's all right. What you got next? All right. So let's see another one here. All right. So one I have talked about before, but uh i'm going to talk about it again because i don't care i love this record a lot uh so this is 2007 i want to say 2009 i lied to you 2009 okay so uh at the time uh and still to this day uh for those series of records uh say anything one of my favorite bands uh especially in high school so say anything lead singer max bemis uh he uh, his favorite band forever was saves the day and uh, his dream was to work with or meet uh, Chris Connolly from Saves the Day, the lead singer of Saves the Day. And that was his, his idyllic world where, where he would you make that record, right? Uh, or um, work with him or, you know, record with him, whatever, right? So when, they, when Say Anything got kind of big, they ended up touring with Saves the Day and they became friends. And then you know, Max befriended Chris, which is, again, his dream. So um, there were rumblings about this record for like, I want to say a year or two before it ever kind of came together. And uh, the band is called two tongues and that's max bemis or no max bemis and that's uh chris conley and uh so they I never made a realized that together. was them interesting oh yeah, yeah 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 um so they did a super group and they wrote love songs basically more or less to each other throughout the entire record so it's they're you know they're both trading vocal back and forth and it, they're telling stories in each song for the most part. And it's all about how much they love each other. And like, it's a duet, like it would be a male or female, but it's just them or whatever. Right. Okay. Now they weren't involved. In anything, I was just the, that was just the way the band was. And sure. so it's the songs wrote themselves. So like, um, anyway, so when the record came out, it was a very, very big deal. I remember when it leaked, that was a massive deal on the forums. Cause it was like, you know, cause at that point, saying anything was, at the, it was at their most popular they'd ever been saves the day. It always been like, uh, They've, they've been popular, but they were never as popular. They're never as like big as maybe they should have been at certain points. They were more respected than anything else, like more like legendary kind of status, I guess, at, at that point. And so uh, they just thought like that super group would be the greatest thing in the world, right? And this record turned out really well. Um, so the first single was Crawl. Uh, I've talked about that song before, I believe. And uh, I that was the first single, and that was the first leak, I want to say, as well. Um, that song uh, is so good. That song is truly a duet back and forth between them. And uh, it's it's basically, it's it's them breaking in a relationship. And it's, I want to say it's Max uh, basically illustrating to Chris why they shouldn't be together. And it's just them just talking about how horrible the relationship was, whatever. And uh, I completely, because it's more, it's more Say Anything sound than it is Saves the Day, which is how I prefer it. Because I like Saves the Day enough, but I don't like it as much as I like this era of Say Anything. Uh, the next, basically from here on out, I've been out on Say Anything for the most part. So I've been out on Say Anything for almost 15 years. Um, because just, I don't care about anything Max Bemis almost does. But, um, so anyway, so uh, Crawl was the first single. If I Can Make You Do Things, uh, that was uh, that, that came out, I believe, next. Wowie Zowie was another one that came out. Um, Tremors, another cool song. Um, it's, it, it, even if you don't, uh, was the closer on this record. Um, they're really cool. Like I said, it's a lot more say anything, a flavor, pop punk, emo, whatever you want to kind of say that, 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 you know, sound is. It's a lot more of that than it is saves the day. So if that's what you're into and you have not checked out Two Tongues for whatever reason, I would definitely recommend doing so. They made a second record, which, uh, wasn't as good. I listened to it once and kind of just like d disregarded it. I don't care. Um, they're not going to do one again, uh, cause they had a, uh, 
falling out of sorts. So, uh, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, for the time, uh, this definitely sounds, uh, of the, of the time or whatever, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I just think, uh, this level of experimentation, this level of artistic kind of like, you know, artistic, you know, vision from Max, this, this era is just so good. Uh, and I say that because obviously I think I've talked about before in defense of the genre is my favorite say anything record. This is coming off of that record. Uh, in that tour, in that era, in that sound. So this is the the perfect combination for me at the time. So there you go. So Two Tongues, Max Bemis, Chris Conley. Recommend checking it out if you haven't done so. We've only pressed this once on this picture disc. It's the only way to get it. Uh, unfortunately, I wish they would do a straight press, but given the fact that they're not really a band anymore and they're not really together, uh, you know, friendly-like, uh, and Max is not doing good in general, um, probably not going to happen anytime soon, unfortunately, but... You know, there you go. I yeah. wish they would have toured this. I wish they ever did, but I wish they would have toured this. I want to say they did play Crawl because when they did, they've toured together multiple times with Same Thing and Saves the Day, and they did anniversary tours together. And I do want to say they played some songs on the one of those tours. I could be lying to you, yeah. but I want to say I've seen a song. It's fall twenty ten. Yes. Uh, they did their first performance as a surprise in the middle of Say Anything set each night of the Motion City soundtrack Say Anything and Saves the Day tour. I saw that tour, they perform. Yeah. They perform the song "Crawl." There you go. Okay, nice. You are, Look at this, this memory of mine. Wow, <laughs> you're remembering correctly. Yeah, and then and I, you might have mentioned the 2016. They were going to do the 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 tour. And oh wow! For the second record. Yeah, they were going to do a tour, and then it got canceled. And then they were, they said uh, we aren't going to play shows in the foreseeable future due to unforeseen circumstances. Uh, but we yeah. we may play again in the future, or we may play in the future, and then that was that that's never happened. So interesting, yeah. unfortunately. Interesting. Uh, say anything is I I don't know I it's obviously named at the movie, correct? Yeah, I mean more or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, there was a lot of like movie references and stuff like that uh, in the in that beginning era of the band. And at first, it was just Max, and then Max and Colby, the drummer, and then kind of blew up. But it was always mostly just Max. Um, but yes, you're correct. Gotcha. Okay. Um, all right. My next one here. And a lot of these are a lot of these, it's kind of falls into the super group side project, just nature. Like that's the nature of it. For sure. Um uh probably the second one I thought of after the Wilbury's Temple of the Dog. Uh, this is the record that Chris Cornell did with uh Pearl Jam before they were Pearl Jam. This is after Mother Love Bone uh broke up. Uh broke up i guess when andy andy wood died this is the tribute they were originally just going to do one song and then chris was like this is stupid let's just do an album and uh, they did the album and this is the first time anybody heard any better on hunger strike and then obviously you got the pearl jam gig right after that and the rest is history um just a stellar record man like top to bottom really great songs hunger strikes obviously iconic um everybody knows those vocals uh, Reach Down, really good song. Say Hello to Heaven, really good song. Uh, pushing Forward Back. Like, those are the first four songs. Like, the first, it's really like top heavy at the beginning there. But yeah. front to back, really solid, really cool sounds. Like, if you're into any of that Seattle sound, like, this is it. Uh, like, they really sum it up really well. Um, yeah, Cornell sounds really good. Um, they did do like a 25th anniversary tour of this in like 2015. And Eddie didn't do it. He was busy. <laughs> like I find yeah. that weird. Like your your whole band's on tour, and you're just like, nah. Like they did a tour, which I, I okay, maybe you don't want to do the whole tour because like you're basically just singing one song every night. But uh, like they were in Seattle, they played the big show in Seattle, and like he didn't even go to that, which I think like, it's just really weird. I Hilarious. have seen a video of them doing it though, like recent, like you know, obviously with Eddie. Past, but- yeah, so like they did it at some point. It might have been a sound garden show, honestly. It could have just been a sound garden show that Eddie showed up at. But I did mm. see I have seen a video of them doing it recently. It just might it probably wasn't that tour, which that yeah, that they, I understand. Yeah, you're right. Like they didn't tour they it, did it. Weird. Pearl Jam did it in November of 2016. Oh, there you go. Uh, I think. And uh or no, that is never mind. That's Temple of Dog. I'm reading that thing. Yeah, okay. so that's the that's the Seattle show. Okay. And Eddie didn't do Eddie, Eddie Eddie didn't do any of the shows on the tour, and he didn't even do the Seattle show, which I find weird. The crowd sang Eddie's part, um, and Cornell dedicated the song to him. So 
said he had family commitments. So maybe there was something serious going on. So who knows? But yeah. I just find it interesting. But um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure Pearl Jam has done some uh, since Chris passed. Like they, I think they did it like this tribute after he passed. But uh, yeah, this is a really good record. If you never dove into this and you're in, if you're if you're even a passing fan of Pearl Jam or Soundgarden, it's way worth a listen. Way worth. I think it. that record has some of Cornell's best vocals ever. Really like, good because he. He really? just roars and just just wails on the entire thing, and it's so good. Chris Cornell's vocals, I think, as I get older, I think I appreciate them more and more um, because his voice is just—he had the best voice, he had the best voice in the scene, uh, and that's just—I yeah. don't know how much debate you can have there. Like he just, his voice was so iconic, and he was so good, and he had so much range, and he could—I mean, when he was younger, especially, he could just shred his voice every night and be okay and just play the next night and just keep going and keep going and just wail. And uh, he just did that for years. And, you know, he's, it's, it's crazy. He's the, he's the Steve Perry of that generation. Truly, truly. Sure. Um, it's yeah, it's crazy. And he never lost it really. Like I want to like, it's, I mean, until the very end, you know, he still sounded like Chris Cornell. He never really had that many, as far as I know, obviously I'm not the super fan, but I don't think he had very many vocal issues as he got older. Like he just, he kept it going. And he nah, just, there, there's, <laughs> You listen to solo stuff and like when he does the like nothing compares to you. Like you watch that live. Ooh, it's so good. It's so and that's good. later. Yeah. That's later in his life. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's super good. Um yeah, Chris's voice is just it aged so so well. And uh sucks, uh sucks he's not here, obviously. So yeah. But Temple Dog is a super cool record. I, I like it a lot. Yeah. Definitely a good one. What you got next? All right. So Another one that came to mind almost immediately, and this technically counts. So I did the exact same. Again, we talked before. I did the same uh, qualifiers, and it can't be a new band. It has to be a secondary band, right? So this 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 scathed on the line, but it counts. Uh, the band is Straylight Run. Uh, it's Sean uh, Cooper, John Nolan, and uh, Michelle Nolan, uh, his sister, uh, 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 John's sister, and uh, Will Noon on drums. So uh, in 2002, um, Take Back Sunday, uh, they had just recorded and released uh, Tell Your Friends. And on that tour, we talked about this a couple of episodes or whatever. On, the, on that tour, um, they got in a fight because uh, Adam Lazara uh who uh, is the lead singer take my sunday was dating michelle john's sister cheated on michelle was a drunk did some bad things you know whatever and so john was like i'm not doing this anymore i can't do it so i'm out of the band he quit he had recently been working on demos uh for another band that he didn't feel these songs fit with take my sunday with uh mark o'connell the drummer of take my sunday he had been working on those demos uh, to release later on because, he, like I said, he just didn't feel as though they'd matched the band. So after he quit the band, he just took over Straight Run full time. He was like, this, this is it. This is what's happening now. So it was a band that at one point in time was a side project, became the primary, and then John went okay. back to the band anyway, back to Take a Sunday later down the line anyway. So well, whatever. Gotcha. Uh, so technically still kind of, it scales the line, it walks the line a little bit, but I think it still counts. Um, Anyway, uh, there was a lot of bad blood there, obviously, for years, and it all went under the bridge, and everybody got older and matured and made up, and it's all good. They've been together. He's been back in the band now for, like, 12 years, which is insane to think about. It's crazy. Um, But uh, anyway, this record is a major, major record for a lot of the emo kids from the mid-early 2000s, especially if you grew up with the Take Back Sunday records, um, because uh, John is an amazing songwriter, uh he's amazing he's a great musician too uh i again talked episodes ago he's not the best guitarist they ever had uh in take back sunday not by a long shot but his art uh, his artistic ability and his songwriting is just it's it's so good um so uh the big song on this record is existentialism existentialism on prom night that was a major myspace song a major profile song a major video on fuse at the time um it's a piano driven song and uh, it's John just, it just, you know, his voice just sounds so good. And uh, a lot of this is built, built around the piano for the most part. 
And uh, it's just, you know, because they were demos that John wrote in the piano and just kind of went from there and then uh, brought the band in. Uh, so uh, I would recommend this if you are a fan of the quieter parts of Tell Your Friends, I guess. Um, there's not big roaring guitars or anything on this record at all. Um, it's mostly just, you know, like I said, piano driven, you know, little rock songs. Uh, for me, I like the entire record front to back. This and the EP, uh, the Parody Wrong EP, those two releases for me are are absolutely perfect. Uh, they had another record after that uh, called Un Mas Dos, I believe it is. And uh, not my style. Uh, they had a, The Needles in the Space is another record they did. Not necessarily my style for it. It's, there's still some cool stuff on there, but for my, for my money, it's this and the, the, the Parody Wrong EP. Um, so uh, Tension and the Terror, great song. Mistakes We Knew We Were Making, that's another killer, killer track. I have put that on for many, many a woman and uh, in the car, and they've been very into it. Um, Your Name Here, Sunrise Highway, which is supposedly uh, another song in the back and forth uh, brand new drama. Uh, Take Back Sunday, John Nolan, brand new drama that from way, way back when. Uh, so another thing you can throw in there. Um, and uh, Sympathy for, for Martyr. Sympathy for the Martyr closes it out. Another cool song. Um, again, uh, for my money, I, I don't hate any of this. So I mean, I'm a bad, bad, uh, bad person to ask, but I think this is one of the best, uh, lesser appreciated releases from that era. The demos mm-hmm. for this record were a big deal. Like when the demos leaked on, I believe, Pure Volume or MP3.com way, way back, that was a major, major deal uh it, kids lost their minds over it and they didn't know when the record was going to come out and it was a whole hype you know beast and uh when the record came out it delivered so there you go uh straight that run self-titled check it out buy it i'm sure it's out there victory records i'm sure it's pressed this a few times so there you go so. yeah their their uh wiki still has their myspace on there so that's cool hell uh, yeah i love it and then uh yeah <clears throat> did show did a show in 2021 so they did they opened for taking sunday which oh, that's which was a total weirdo crossover thing <clears throat> because it's mm-hmm. like that was the they were the they broke up that was the big rivalry there, yeah. sort of kind of like you know there's bad blood there so the fact that it all came back together with them opening uh for the you know the take my sunday it's just it's yeah it was crazy um i want to say my friend mm-hmm. melissa went to that show and uh she was very very she's she's a massive take my sunday fan huge that's her that's her bank okay and uh she, gotcha. I think, got the set list from that show too, and uh, she was over the moon about it. And I was very yeah, was jealous. A, I'd never seen them before. It was in New York, so that's yeah, cool. yeah. She, uh, cool. She, uh, she lives here, but she routinely flies all over the country to go see them everywhere possible they play. And I just actually found this out, which is really interesting. Shout out Melissa. I don't know if you watch it or not, but if you do, shout out. She, um. So Adam Lazar, just side note, Adam Lazar, a lead singer, take back Sunday, her band, you know, her favorite band. Uh, he had a jean jacket that he had made uh, that had take back Sunday, like embroidered on the back. And then it had like a, uh, a tiger, I want to say in the middle, like a, a black tiger or a panther, maybe, I don't know. Uh, and then they had, they had take back, and had a, I think established 2000 or whatever on the bottom, you know, whatever. And uh, basically a, like a biker kind of cut kind of deal. Right. Mm-hmm. And so he wore that around forever. And then she made her own, and uh they display they now have displayed her uh her vest a jacket whatever vest at the punk rock museum in las vegas oh, nice. in vegas so, yeah and next to the take back sunday exhibit about pop punk or emo you know early mid 2000s stuff that's at the punk rock museum is uh melissa's uh created vest so just random thing that i saw the other day so there's that yeah when we were when we were up there i wanted to go through there but we just didn't have the time Looks cool. Night, Looks so. super sick. Yeah. yeah so yeah. If I, next time I'm over there, I want to. I want to do that before it closes, because inevitably will close because I don't see unless unless Billy Joe Armstrong is going to be keep pumping money into that, which I think I think he does. Oh, okay. uh, unless he, you know, I think he does. Um, unless that's the thing that's going to persist. I that I think that that has the days are numbered on that. Uh, so it might only be open here for a little while. Gotcha. Cool. I'm going to pull up a band here that uh, Tyler will probably remember um, a little side project. 
and uh, I don't have anything physical for them, so I'll just I'm gonna pull up a YouTube and we'll play a little play a little YouTube clip here. Uh, the band is Times of Grace, and uh, that is the side project from Adam D and Jesse Leach yes. from Kill Switch Engage, and. Um, I really dug this record. This this is Hymn of a Broken Man. This came out in 2011. So it's kind of weird because I want to say Howard was still in Kill Switch because this is before mm-hmm. Jesse coming back to Kill Switch. Yeah. And uh, they have been working on this record, him and him and Jesse, since 2007. And then Howard would leave and then Jesse would come back. This is the record where I really got into Jesse because that first Kill Switch album, I'm not a huge fan of. Like uh, the end of heartache, like that's my kill switch album. That's when I really got into the band. That's the album I still listen to regularly. Um, but this is the album that I really started appreciating Jesse. And now when I go back to those newer uh, kill switch albums for the like, last five years at the end of Jesse, I always find stuff that I like mostly because of this record. I've really learned to appreciate him. And um, I describe this record as like metal core gospel. Mm-hmm. It is very, gospely like i don't i don't think it's religious but it has that vibe to it and it's it's like kill switch it's very positive very uplifting songs uh live and love is my favorite song here we'll play like a we'll play a little bit of it you can hear tyler right Hmm. okay turn up a little bit Yeah, so Adam and Jesse trade vocals here. Um, yeah, this this whole record is really, really solid. Um, I would highly recommend this if you've never listened to it. I actually posted about this on Instagram the other night, and I had, like, I hashtag Kill Switch. And, like, a lot, of, I had a couple comments and likes and stuff on Kill Like, I didn't even know this existed. Wow. So, like, thanks for posting this and shit. They just did a record in 2021, too. That's okay. But this chorus is really good. Yeah, I, I just... The vocals, like, it's very gospel And then, like, towards the end here, this... Yeah, so this is this is why I kind of call it like gospel-y metalcore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get that vibe. Yeah, I remember. Uh, obviously, I was I was I, I like Killswitch enough, but I was never a huge fan. But I do. I had a lot of friends that were huge fans of Killswitch, and you as well. Obviously, I know you that that era, especially what you're you're a massive fan of with Howard and stuff. But um, I remember when they announced that project. And then people started talking about, oh, so the day is going to come where Jesse comes back to Kill Switch. Like this is just the, mm-hmm. this is just the first step. You know, Howard's out eventually here pretty quick, and then it's going to be Jesse. And then eventually that happened. And uh, you know, it wasn't too long after, right? But uh, it's no. uh, and then Howard, Howard, uh, I haven't really heard. I he, I'm sure I know he has a band. I haven't really heard anything about his stuff they- for a while. He did a band, and then the interesting part about this is that him and Adam were writing together, uh, like a few months ago. Interesting. So okay. There's gonna be <laughs> there, no, there isn't any bad blood. And there could be a, there could be like a, a times of grace with with Howard. So interesting. Uh, I wonder be if interesting. Uh, so I wonder if they'd ever be in the situation of like like a Halloween deal, like you just went and saw. Get them both back. Yeah. Like if no one has any uh, bad blood, there's no ego really involved in stuff, and like there's enough records now where they both could definitely pull out the songs yeah. they they're on. Yeah. Like and I'm sure there's fan there's fans. Oh, there's way here. there's way more Jesse records now, but oh that's yeah, true. There, I guess it's new. There could be that that could be really cool. I think they both are very similar in their vocals. That's that's fair. Um, to where I don't I don't know if it lends with Halloween they're like all the singers have very different. they're similar but they're different 
they are way different in a way. Yeah. Whereas Jesse and Howard are different. So I, that could be cool. That could be cool. Yeah. I don't know if it, I don't know if like maybe just maybe a tour, maybe not like coming back to the band, maybe an anniversary show or something rather. They do exactly that could yeah. be cool. But I think there's definitely an album coming at least with Adam and and Howard. So if you're into Kill Switch, if you're into Adam's playing, which I am, I I I think he's a really a uh, cool dude. I think he's I, I've never heard anything bad about the dude. I know a lot of people love him, and uh, I've seen him live plenty like three or four times. They always put in a good show. He's always entertaining, and I think he's a really good player. So if you're into him you're into Jesse's vocals, like check that out because, and two, like I learned to appreciate Jesse so much more by listening to that record. And yeah. uh, this is why I appreciate that. Because I, I kind of just completely forgot about that, that album. And then I, wow. I listened to that album like three, I listened to that album like three or four times this last week. Nice. So, uh, so yeah, it got me back into that record. So that, that that's awesome. Definitely positive. I, yeah. I've always heard good things about Adam, Adam like Adam D. Like he, there was a time where like a lot of bands were working with him. Uh, oh yeah, and, uh, yeah. I mean that probably still happens now, but I maybe I just don't. I'm not mm-hmm. my I'm not in the pulse like that anymore. But I remember like a lot of bands would announce records produced by Adam D. That went on for like two, three, four years there. Uh, that he worked yeah. a lot of bands. But, yeah, he's definitely well respected and well liked within that scene, like for sure. And uh, never really heard bad things. So yeah, super cool. All 100%. about that. Yeah, uh, love it. There you go. I'm glad that you uh you came back into it. Uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good thing. All right, so. I think I talked about this record recently. I could be lying to you, but I think I did because I found it on my turntable and I had not listened to it recently. So I think I want to talk about it on here for some reason. Maybe not. Uh, All okay. right. Uh, this is Head Automatica Decadence. Have I talked about this record recently? I do not think so. Never mind. Okay, cool. All right. This, this is fine. So anyway, so this record is Daryl Palumbo from Glassjaw. So uh, hmm. Daryl, um, Glassjaw's... I love Glashaw so much. Uh, the first, I mean, they only have three records really, but um, they're all, they're all really, really good. And uh, they're a post hardcore um, band from New York, uh, late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, I think metalcore, like, I don't know, whatever sub genres people put in there for them. I don't know. They were on Roadrunner runner there at the time. And uh, they were very successful uh, within that era and that scene. And they later went on to Warner, I believe. And uh, then, so at Warner, Daryl is very uh, eclectic in his tastes and what he wants to do. And so another part of Daryl's story is he has Crohn's disease. And so Daryl would unfortunately be laid up a lot and he would be unable to tour with Glassjaw. So Daryl would be at home writing and working on things and kind of just seeing where his muse took him, right? So from Glassjaw being very loud, aggressive, scream, you know, all that stuff, uh, he, with his taste, went into a dance record and a dance project, which turned into Head on Amatica. And this is very, very dancey. Uh, it's very, like, disco-y at certain points. Like, it's electronic. It's really, really cool stuff. Okay. Um, so this record uh, came out on Warner Brothers, uh, 2000 and... 2004 so that yeah that makes sense because that's right after worship and tribute so um when he turned the record into uh warner brothers uh there's a massive song on here that song being beating heart baby so i don't know if you know the song off the top of your head ty when i say that to you does that mean anything to you no but i know this i know this name and yeah. i i never knew he was this so, i never knew go on he, YouTube. The dude from Glass. okay yeah pull it up I believe because this song was every it's the most successful thing he's ever done. Like a hundred percent it is. Gotcha. Um, it was a massive MySpace song. Uh yeah, it was it. for years and still actually is still probably his most played song routinely every single year he's ever been involved in. Um it's uh, I think That's it's helpful. a cool video too. It's got 1.9 million plays. This will get yeah. caught. This will get caught right big time, so So hold on. So yeah, it's it's uh you know uh Okay, cool. And then go to the chorus, skip ahead a little bit, and just go to the chorus. Right there. Right here. Nah, I don't think I've ever heard this before. Wow. Okay. So okay, so anyway. Uh, this song, uh, I'm really impressed. You, uh, it was everywhere for a while there, but 
Um, yeah. Anyway, so it's a lot of the whole record is a lot of this, it's a lot of this sound. Um, so Be Our Baby, uh, Brooklyn's Burning, okay. a cool song, The Razor, um, I Shot William H. Macy, another a cool song, Close It Out. Um, so he made this record and uh, it became very successful. I want to say it went platinum, like it sold a lot of copies. And so Warner Brothers, uh, he made another record called Propaganda. And uh, Warner Brothers convinced him to because they, you know, whatever they thought they knew what was going on. So they were like, hey, put Beating Heart Baby on Propaganda too. And he was just like, I don't know. I don't want to do that. And he's like, it's going to sell. And he's like, all right, fine. So he put it on Propaganda too. And uh, it kind of worked, I guess, or whatever, right? And uh, he always just thought that was very artistically, obviously, you know, bullshit. He should have done that. Hmm. He would wouldn't have done that and then he made another record called swan damage in the time because glass jaw was was basically kind of done for a while there they would do some things here and there but like the glass jaw the third glass jaw record was a legend uh like a myth basically uh for many 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 years and uh it was constantly always being talked about that was done and people would interview uh, daryl about it like yeah it's done it's gonna come out next year and that went on for like a decade and it did more than a decade because it didn't come out until like the record record they made eps and stuff like that but the record record didn't come out until like three or four years ago and the last one was in 02 so uh anyway uh the third uh, automatic record is very much the same called swan damage it's another mythical record that uh, he handed over to warner brothers and they shelved it immediately they wanted nothing to do with it and uh daryl has since talked about it i just actually read an interview with him maybe like a month or two ago and he talked about the Swan Damage record, because again, it's a, it's a mythological thing. And he said that he has the songs, he has the record, it is done. Uh, and he's like, he said that, uh, you know, I'm sure people have it, uh, that maybe one day we'll leak it out. But, uh, you know, I'm not, I can't do it because obviously I got contracts and stuff, but uh, I'm sure it'll find, it, find its way out at some point. And so hopefully at some point, somebody uh, will put it out there. Uh, gotcha. and, uh, I was not as much into the second record. There's a big song called graduation day that was on it. And, uh, it's a cool song. And that was the big lead single on it. But for my money, decadence is the, uh, that's, a, that's the record to get. So, uh, head automatica decadence. If you're into super pop dancey stuff and with Daryl's vocals, uh, Daryl's clean vocals would definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, Daryl's a great musician. He has a really, really eclectic taste in everything he does. He's worked with, countless people with a bunch of different vibes and uh if that's if this is your vibe uh you know check out everything else so there you go that's cool i'm gonna have to check that out i think i would probably like that yeah it's it's a it's a good time huh. very cool all right i'm gonna go with uh somebody tyler's de- i know Tyler definitely knows this band i don't think you've ever listened to him though um this is a- i know what you're gonna say i don't i have never listened to him you don't know what the hell i'm gonna say i don't think you know what i'm gonna say does it involve you in Seattle? No, it does not. Okay, all right, never mind. I'm not talking about. It's not okay. Uh, I'm gonna bring up uh, a band. Uh, I got two of their albums here. They got four, and they're actually in the studio now doing the long-awaited follow-up for their fifth album, and that is uh, Black Country Communion. Yes. Okay, I know about that. I've never listened to them. Yes. So, uh, so this is uh, Glenn Hughes uh, on vocals and bass from Glenn Hughes Deep Purple, the voice of rock. Uh, Joe Bonamassa guitar uh, virtuoso was playing with BB King and shit at like 13 years old. Yeah. Uh, Jason Bonham on drums and uh, Derek Sherinian, formerly of Dream Theater, on uh, keys. And uh, this is uh, the first album. And this is uh, uh, volume two. And uh, they've got four albums. And like I said, they're just back in the studio to do the fifth album. I think the last one came out like. 2016 or something but um yeah really cool stuff like if you're into like bluesy hard rock deep purple white snake uh a little bit of zeppelin uh yeah like it's it's way up your alley great guitar work glenn sounds amazing um out of these two records i'd probably recommend the first one more than the second one Um, i'll play a little bit of like the big single uh just because i don't i don't know if tyler's ever heard the song and this song was i've been listening to these a lot too uh this last uh week for this and this is one last soul off the first record and 
this song is really cool. This is the second, uh, yeah, second song on the first album. And uh, really cool vibes. Kind of Southern Rocky, too. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, 2010. Yeah, yes, 2010 just, was the first album. Yeah. Just 12 years old. Really catchy chorus here. It's a good earworm song. Yeah, Glenn Hughes still sounds this good, by the way. Yeah. It, it's um, crazy it, how, how, how it's he's 70. He's 71, I think now. Yeah. Or 72. Because yeah. they announced the Deep Purple Burn uh, 15th anniversary tour that he's playing. And they're yes. coming here. And I, I really want to go to that. And I was watching live footage of him in Europe. And I'm like, he still sounds really good. He sounds as good as he does on this album from 12 years ago. That's a really cool song. That's One Last Soul. Uh, yeah, check them out if you haven't. I remember when they came out and dropped. Like, I remember them getting really hyped. Yeah. And, um, like, I just started really listening to them, like, maybe in the last six months is, like, when I started doing the Deep Purple stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I gave it a shot. These were, like, five bucks at Zia. So, I'm like, okay. Uh, way cheaper than the vinyl. So, but, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll am gonna give them a shot. And, like, I liked all four. The other two albums I've listened to on Spotify, I like all of them. My only gripe is Kevin Shirley does all the production, and I'm not a Kevin Shirley fan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's the dude who does all the Maiden albums. I do not like his production. I don't like, I just don't like his production. I know he's a cool dude. I know all the dudes in this band love him. And that's why like they keep bringing him back, but I just don't like his production, but uh, cool albums. Nonetheless, black country communion. I, yeah, I've, I've not really, I've heard a little bit there because uh, I remember when that record came out, because at that point that was like prime when I was watching like VH1 classic a lot in that metal show. And I believe all of them were on that metal show at one point or another. Yes, and I know Eddie Trunk yeah. is a massive fan of that band. And uh, so he would jock them a lot. And he still to this day jocks them and stuff like that because he's had on all those guys individually on mm -hmm. his radio show. And, and whenever I listen, you know, uh, they'll come on there sometimes. Right. And uh, that's always a, one of the first things they talk about is like what's going on with black country and whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And everyone always just says it's Joe it's all joe like whatever because everybody else could do it if they really wanted to they could just do it and they could make it work in their schedule but the thing about it is joe makes so much money being joe bonamassa that it mm. doesn't make financial sense for him to carve out two months out of the year to go tour or do this or do that or whatever like he can do a record probably but him actually dedicating time to touring it is just a whole nother thing. And the thing about it is like, they can't really tour without him because I mean, they could obviously, but because he's such a major part of the band of the sound, it would kind of be disingenuous to call it what it is without him. So when yes. they play shows or when they've ever toured, you know, to whatever extent they have, it's all because Joe basically is calling the shot there and allowing him to do it. And I think that's kind of how it still works out now. So like records are yeah. still possible from what I know, but like touring and making sure. it a thing, it's not a thing. Yeah, they're doing a new album right now. They're in the studio right now. Glenn was posting on Instagram about it. So um, he was in L.A. doing vocals and stuff. And they were all together in the studio. So it's like a thing where they're getting together and actually writing and recording together uh, yeah. and not over the Internet. So that's probably hard, too, when they want to do it like that. Uh, For sure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because uh, it's been, uh, I think, like 2017 or 2016 was uh, was uh, BCC4. So, yeah. Uh, also, I think it's just poor uh massive uh joe bonamassa fan my mother massive really massive joe bonamassa fan she, she has... like black country so i don't think that she's ever actually listened to black country before wow but she has all of his solo stuff and so when she drove me to the airport uh in november when i was going to atlanta she drove me to the airport and uh, she put on, and she's like, have you heard this? And I was like, who is it? And she goes, and I already knew who it was going to be because she's talked to me about it before. And uh, mm. she's like, it's Joe Bonamassa because she forgets that she tells me things, right? Because she's old. Yeah. And so I'm like, yes, mom, I know who this is. I've listened a little bit. I know what's going on. Like, I, I, But I've never really listened. Like, I know enough. And she goes, he's just so good. And he's sexy, too. Just keep on his sunglasses. But he's sexy. That's what she says. <laughs> she's she's really into uh, ugly guys. Tell, she likes tell ugly her to guys. check. 
tell her to check this out. Yeah, like, I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll, 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 I'll send her a text. And uh, yeah, she will. Because uh, there's really good. He's really good on this. Like, especially later in the album, like there's a couple really, there's like a seven minute song, Stand, uh, yeah. track 10, Stand at the Burning Tree. That song is a really good, like, guitar bluesy song. Uh, Too Late for the Sun is the last track. It's like 11 minutes, and he's really good on it. Um, yeah. Yeah, he's he's a really talented dude. So I mean, I think she, asked- I think she, I think she dig that too, especially if you know, uh, her growing up with Zeppelin and shit like that. Like, it's got that vibe. So, for sure, uh, she, I mean, she might. I don't. I, I, I would imagine she doesn't, but she might. Um, I think what helped helped out too is uh, uh, Joe Bonamassa's specials have aired on PBS, and so oh, that okay. has brought him in gotcha. front of a new audience. So, gotcha. there you go. nice. There you go. Yeah, so that all worked out. But uh, yeah, I need to check those records. Yeah. I've always meant to. Every time I ever hear like guys on Trunk talking about them and stuff, because like what Trunk says is like, like his view on it, I think is like that band could make, make could do business, but like just Joe does so much business on his own that he think that it's just not yeah. a thing. I could see them definitely touring, and if they got on good packages, like being a, I don't know, like a five thousand seat, yeah, theater. Uh, yeah, especially with the names involved in it. Yeah. I mean, Glenn Hughes and Jason Bonham, even Derek Sherinian, like he was in Dream Theater for five years. Like guys, everybody, everybody loves a lot of the dreams. They're all mu- the musicians of musicians is who they are, you know. So like those those virtuoso kind of you know deals or legends or whatever. It's a, you know, it's a it's a massive thing. Uh, definitely. Yeah, I need to check these records out. F and A. Very I didn't know you were gonna bring it out, bring that heat. So I appreciate you bringing the heat like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I Ain't, ain't throwing no knuckleballs here, okay? Bringing right. just bringing the hard stuff tonight. Uh, I get it. All right, where so, the heater, kid? Uh, uh, one, another one that I, I can't bring up with uh, if we're doing uh, this kind of a deal. Uh, favorite band, Manchester Orchestra. Uh, one of my favorite uh, solo musicians is Kevin Devine. They are very good friends, best friends, if you will. And so when I saw them. Uh, on the brand new tour, so I got introduced to both of those bands because I was a, a ba- massive brand new fan. Am a massive brand new fan. They're not a band anymore, but whatever. But uh, so I saw brand new on that tour in 07 and Manchester, their first tour ever, national tour. Uh, they opened, and then Kevin was main support, and then brand new played. So I was exposed to all of them uh, that night, and so they also uh, got to know each other on that tour, uh, became very good friends, and they almost an instantaneously started talking about making a band together. Uh, it wasn't until 2009, 2010, right? Yeah, I think so. Well, uh, yeah, it doesn't say anything. I think it's 2009. Uh, they made a band called Bad Books, and Bad Books is Manchester Orchestra plus Kevin Devine. And uh, so this is Bad Books Volume One. They have three records out now, uh, and they're working on a fourth uh, uh, as we speak. Every so often, when they get time. Uh, Kevin comes down from New York into Atlanta and they record and figure some stuff out and write some stuff. Um, so this was a big deal at the time when it came out. This is Manchester coming off of uh, the Mean Everything to Nothing tour, which is their first uh, first major label record. And uh, there was a lot of hype around that. And Kevin was still, I mean, he's never really been massive, massive, but he had just gotten off of the uh, capital deal he was on. And he had just put out uh, the record Brothers Blood, which is probably his biggest record still to this day. So they're both at the top um, at that point in time, you know, the top they'd ever been, the biggest they'd ever been. And uh, so they recorded Bad Books Volume 1. And uh, they toured this. Uh, they, I think they played 15 dates total, maybe seven and seven, East Coast, West Coast. And uh, I saw the LA date. You were actually supposed to go to that tour. We asked you to go to that date at the Troubadour. Uh, it was actually me, Zach, and uh, Bra- oh. Braxton. And yes. I believe that uh, you didn't. You just didn't want to make the drive, really. But also, that was no. a big. Uh, the next day was a big Steelers uh, Steelers playoff game. It was like the same day. Same day, yeah, same day, yeah. yeah so was like, that was the Super Bowl year. I'm pretty sure. Correct. That was 20, 2010, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so dude, I wasn't missing that, Ron. You weren't going to do that. So, yeah. So we decided to go last minute and uh, we drove up to L.A., saw the saw the show. And uh, that date was actually super cool. Uh, That tour tour was very cool because they basically broke it into like little like they all opened for each other. So like 
uh, Rob, uh, the guitarist, has a band or has his own solo project called Goatron. He played a set. And then uh, Chris had Alaska him nicely. Uh, he played a set. And then uh, Andy has his own solo thing that might make an appearance here in a little bit. Uh, he uh, played a set. And then uh, Kevin played a little set as well. And then they all, the headline was Bad Books. And so uh, it was my first show ever at the Troubadour. And I was blown away. It was, it was so cool just to be there because it's obviously a legendary venue. It's where yeah. everybody played the first time and so many other people have played there over the years and everything, right? So I was very, very freaked out just to be there. Um, so uh, it was a very cool show. There's a lot of videos from that. And uh, I'm in a lot of those videos as a awkward, weird 17, 18-year-old kid uh, with long hair and looking really <laughs> you know, worse for wear. Uh, I also had a horrible headache that day. Anyway... Uh, the music is, uh, it definitely is a combination of the two. Um, Kevin's voice, uh, Kevin and Andy, have, uh, they, they play up each other really nicely in their vocal styles. Um, they uh, usually, you know, sing whatever, whoever wrote the song, they sing the song and then so-and-so does backing vocals or whatever. And uh, they bring in ex uh, cool experimentation in here. Uh, uh, there's a song called Baby Shoes. That's just a cool, like a jam song, kind of sort of like a, like a heavy jam song. And uh, you wouldn't have to ask. It's like, it's like there's heavy little spots in there too, which is really, it's probably, it was really surprising the first time I heard that. Cause at that point, like Manchester on Mean Everything Nothing is a little heavier, but this, like they kind of got a little crazier, which was it, kind of interesting to me because Kevin is mostly a singer, songwriter, acoustic guy. Um, mm -hmm. So it, just, it was, it kind of caught me off guard, but it's super cool. I like it a lot. Um, so uh, you wouldn't have to ask was the first single uh i think baby shoes they eventually put out as a single uh please move was another big song uh the song mesa arizona uh that was written i want to say the day before i saw kevin for the first time uh in 2009 uh coming into like a little bit coming into arizona so it was kind of cool that i saw him whatever and that song mm. routinely uh gets covered by people uh on tours and stuff like that whatever live but uh they also play that song you know uh, among each other you know on their solo sets or whatever quite often as well because it's a big song for fans uh so mostly just acoustic on that song uh for some of this but uh yeah so if you're a fan of the manchester orchestra sound kevin devine singer songwriter uh you know alt rock emo whatever thing you want to insert the indie music and uh you've heard the, uh, the bands uh i would recommend checking out them together uh, I got this signed by Rob, Katie, and John, or John, well, yeah, literally, but also Andy. So I was lucky enough to get that signed by them. Uh, I missed out. There was a variant uh, that you could actually buy at that show. They sold on tour. They had all of their signatures on there because uh, now uh, two of the guys are no longer in the band. So, like, kind of sucks. So yeah. uh, probably not going to be able to get their signatures, you know, anymore. Um, but, yeah, so they have two records after this. Uh, they have another record with the same lineup. Uh, volume two and they have bad books three uh, which came out two years ago i want to say and it's just uh kevin rob and andy on that and uh it's it's very different it's a lot quieter uh more laid back more acoustic driven uh stuff on there with some piano and like some you know electronic piano kind of sounds or whatever but uh for my money the full band the big band the loud stuff that from the first two records are what i would prefer the band to be uh but you know I think that's what the next chapter is going to be. Again, they're going to go back to that, I think, for volume four, hopefully. So we'll see. But yeah, anyway, bad books. Uh, check them out. Uh, super cool stuff. Would uh, I think it, you'd you'd dig it if you're into that style or into, into those bands. There you go. Was Jesse or anybody for brand new ever supposed to be in, like involved in any of that? No, that was always like a, a legend uh, that that was going to happen like at one point, And then it was quickly okay. pretty much like not a thing because like, jesse doesn't really or uh, he doesn't do anything anymore right but like at the yeah. time uh he would never really have done that like him and kevin uh, uh are were are are still best friends and uh so jesse and kevin have played together live before and kind of done stuff live before but jesse playing on other records off the top of my head has never happened he's only okay. ever played on brand new stuff he's produced I think a couple things uh, I'm thinking of, uh, if, I, if I want, I want to say he's produced a couple things. He produced a Kevin record uh, called Bull bulldozer. Um, and then I want to say he did something else possibly, but uh, no, he was never officially supposed to be part of it. But that was another maybe 
maybe what if kind of thing what if jesse joined whatever but he's never did yeah yeah um gotcha it, it would have been cool though they did play a set which i actually have an lp of they played a set where all three of them played together at looney tunes in new york and uh i have the uh kevin set uh from that it's one of my worst lps that i own sounds like shit looks like shit <laughs> should not exist and it, it's fucking awful. Like it's the worst fucking thing. It's everything's pixelated wow. as fuck. Like I've I called out the uh, so enjoy the ride is who did that record. This is 2012. Mm. I want to say he put that out. And so um, enjoy the ride records put that out. And it looks like garbage. The whole thing's pixelated as all get out. The covers pixelated as shit. Like everything looks like garbage, and it sounds like garbage. And so I. I actually posted about it on Instagram for like one of like the vinyl, like, you know, challenges or whatever vinyl a day challenges. So I posted that as one of the things I did and uh, one of the options. And uh, I commented on there and I actually tagged him because it's, mm. I don't give a shit. So I tagged the dude and I said, uh, here's this or whatever. Uh, it's one of the worst records I own. It looks like shit and it sounds like shit. Uh, you know, I wish enjoy the ride. I put more effort and time into it. And, uh, he tweeted it. His, his name's Ross. Fuck that guy. Still fuck him. Uh, <laughs> he's gotten better recently, but back then he was super shady. Um, and so he tweeted it, or he tweeted. He replied on my Instagram and messaged me and offered me a nice. test pressing of it to make up for it. And uh, I didn't fucking reply. I said I don't. I don't give a fuck. Like I don't care. It sounds like shit. Looks like shit. I talked to Kevin about it like maybe a year mm. or two after it came out, and I was like, I, I told him it was like. Hey man, because I was when Kevin was kind of a free agent, really didn't know what was going on with labels and stuff. And so, uh, enjoy the rides. Not really a record label necessarily. They put out like special releases, like they do all the all the uh, like the the Nicktoons records. They do a lot of the cartoon oh, stuff, okay. the SpongeBob stuff. They do like some movie stuff, like all that stuff kind of goes through them. And uh, he gets licenses and shit. Like he did, he did a release of the Doug, the Beats, uh, like the Doug stuff. He did a release nice. of that. And it was all re-recorded. It wasn't the original audio. It was all re-recorded shit, but he never told anybody about it. And that was kind of like the shadiest shit that fucking happened. Like among, and he also licensed nice. stuff that no one knew that he was licensing. Uh, he did a biscuit re-release, a repress that they didn't fucking know about. He did a uh, he did a Maroon Five repress of of uh, songs about Jane, which whatever it was not a, not shit that guy. But anyway, whatever. I asked Kevin about it, and uh, he said, yeah, that. I, I thought he was a better, I thought it'd be a better deal than what it was. I thought it would be a better product than what it was. Um, gotcha. Yeah, I, 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 w- I rather that didn't exist really. Um, Interesting. So, yeah. Anyway, whatever. Bad books. All right. So. Cool. All right. I'm going to go with something that uh, I know a lot of people don't like, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, I've, I've like learned to appreciate the oddity of it. And this kind of up, uh, it's in Tyler's universe too whether he Ooh. wants it to be or not. So uh, I don't own anything of this. I don't even, I don't even know if I've ever seen the CD and there. I guarantee there's no vinyl pressing of this. If there is okay. like, it's, it's a boot of a boot. Um, I'm going to go with a little side project called two by Rob Halford from wow, okay. oh. priest. So this is Rob's industrial metal project and he uh he met trent reznor at a mardi gras party in new orleans and he gave him the album and trent's like ah shit i'll put this out for you so trent ended up producing it and then uh, putting it out on uh, on nothing and uh i don't know we'll play a little bit of i am a pig um all of it is very (laughs) all all of it is very (laughs) you've never listened to this um all of it is very uh, obviously sexual overtones, like way more than Judas Priest ever was. So Rob was letting the freak flag fly at this point in life. He he was free from the chains of Judas Priest. So. Wait, didn't we? Didn't we hold up? Didn't we listen to this song? I don't know with this song, but didn't we watch like when or was that fight? That wasn't fight, was it? We watched it. Halford. Fight. It was it. It was like a weird video, and like there's a lot of a lot of S and M in a club. No, this. This is this. This is this. Okay. But I can't. I can't find that video anymore. Janine's oh, wow. in that video. Um. So, who did it? Yeah. Right. But right behind you, Janine is in that video. Oh, really? Nice. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. yeah um. Right. Multiple crosses. But uh, yeah, you got multiple crosses in your universe. Um. But uh. Yeah. And then it. 
he was writing the second record for this and then he's just like i'm gonna break this up and then he did fight which is like the pantera kind of rip off band there's some cool stuff in fight though too um but anyway let's play a little of this Very 90s. Yeah, exactly. They're patrolling this. The copyright's going to instantly flag this. Rob, yeah. give me my two cents. <laughs> so it's like very Nine Inch nails -y through Rob Halford. Just not as good. Trent did the whole record, no? I think he produced the whole thing, yeah. yeah. And it's on nothing. I think he did the whole thing for him. I mean, it's a cool song. It's, I mean, I it's a cool combination. Yeah. No, Rob's voice fits it. I can understand if you're a Judas Priest fan and why you hate it. I get it. Uh, especially at this point, because he's gone from Judas Priest. The only thing you want is Rob Halford and Judas Priest, and he's gone. Yeah, yeah. And he's going to do this. <laughs> so, is it sounds fight, nothing. <clears throat> is that fight record anything like Judas Priest or no? No, fights like Pantera. Fights a lot oh, like yeah, Pantera. Yeah, okay, we, sure. yeah. yeah, we have we have listened to or watched a couple fight videos for it's a okay. lot like Pantera. Nice. So okay. um honestly probably like this more. Uh just because it's way different and it's out of his wheelhouse. Yeah. Uh, but it's fun. It's cool. The whole record is really long. Like it's kind of a tiring listen. It's like I think it's like over an hour long, and it's a lot yeah. of the same thing. It'd just be it'd be a really cool EP. Like there's like six songs, like a weird kind of oddity. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't think we ever needed a whole record. Definitely didn't need a follow up. And Rob thought the same thing. So I figured it'd be fun to mention because I'm never gonna talk about that ever again. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> I'm with you 100. Uh, percent I actually kind of oh, also a little okay. Go, I'm sorry. Also, also John Five too was in that band. So I knew that. I did yeah. know that. Wow. Wow. Okay. And then he he joined Manson right after. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Fair enough. All right. I'm going to piggyback off that. And I only have one example because only one example exists. But I do like it a lot. Um, So in that same vein, that same time period-ish as well, late 90s, uh, Trent was uh not really he was you know i think he was still messed up i'm pretty sure he was still using he didn't really he was in writer's block he didn't really know what was going on his nails and he was kind of just hanging out in new orleans and he was talking to friends uh you know big deal friends and trying to make a project happening and that project is called tapeworm i don't know if this ever crossed over into your universe at all because there's a lot of people involved in this project so tapeworm mm -hmm. never actually released a song they don't exist. It, it existed on paper for like a handful of months. And uh, there was pictures in the studio and stuff. So contributor is on the record. Uh, so it's going to be uh, Nine Inch Nails. Or, excuse me, Nine Inch Nails. Trent Reznor. Hmm. It's going to be uh, Atticus Ross, who later joined Trent Reznor. Uh, hmm. Then you had Maynard from Tool, Perfect Circle, obviously. Uh, and then you had Alan Mulder produced it. Uh, uh, he was obviously with all the Nine Inch records and stuff. Uh, okay. Then you had uh, Tommy Victor from Prong and Danzig. You had Danny Loner from Nine Inch Nails, Perfect Circle. Uh, you had Paige Hamilton from Helmet. Uh, you had Josh Freeze, who played in everything Nine Inch Nails, Perfect Circle, you know, whatever, now in Foo Fighters. Uh, yeah. Charlie Clouser from Nine Inch Nails. And then also a guy by the name of one Philip and Selmo. Wow. So, Tapeworm is again, I keep saying this word, but it's totally like an apt word. It's a legendary no, unreleased thing. So, they worked on things for a few months, maybe maybe a year possibly, and uh they so yeah, so so late mid 90s what I'm looking at this now. And um so 96. Anyway, so that kind of was always out there and like people would talk to and ask a trend about it, like, "Hey, you know, you mentioned working with so-and-so and so-and-so on this new project or whatever. And Trent would constantly just go like, yeah, we're, you know, we always, you know, we, we get the chance, you know, kind of figure some stuff out, work with so-and-so, somebody come in, whatever. Right. But Trent is basically the, the conduit of the whole thing. Right. So anyway, uh, eventually 04 rolls around and Trent just calls it dead. 
And when they asked him about it, and he gets asked about it quite a bit, even still gets asked about it quite a bit. And they, he just says like, there's a lot of very good. Wasn't anything great. And he's like, and if we pull together all those names, everything needs to be great. And when I kind of looked at it and nothing was great, it was just really good. I didn't want to put that out. And he's like, and Maynard kind of thought the same thing. And that was the dream for a lot of people, obviously, of Nine Inch Nails and Tool together, because that's a rivalry mm-hmm. among the fan base for some reason. Uh, unbeknownst to me, I don't know why that would be even a thing, but whatever. Uh, but that's a big rivalry. So them together, obviously, would be a massive deal. So anyway, nothing ever came out until years later uh, in 2000 and hold on. It's going to be 2005, 2006 in the band Pussiver. Mm-hmm. The song is Potions. Yeah, I'm not going to no. So that is the only known song, or at least, excuse me, it's not even known. It's suspected because it has Trent on it. And I believe Trent writing produced credits. the song as a writing credit. And I think Trent had a production credit on it as well. And so just process of elimination there just shows you that it was an unreleased, unfinished uh, tapeworm project song. So it's a cool song. Oh, you um, listen to it? Yeah, I have listened to it. It's a cool song. I don't, I don't listen to Pussifer at all. I'm not a Perfect Circle fan. I'm not a Tool fan, really. Like, I don't, like, it's fine. I don't care, though. Um, but I really liked it because it's, I think it's a kind of a blend of sorts. And maybe if I listen to more Pussifer, I would tell you that it's like a Pussifer song. Uh, so maybe I'm talking out of school here. But for my money, it's cool. And like, I like Trent's production styles too because Trent, you can always hear him. Trent has a very, very like distinct sound in his production every time he ever mm-hmm. does anything. And uh, that's kind of something I like. Just distortion, glitch, kind of like, you know, just he has have a feel to it. So uh, Potions, uh, that's the song. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Nothing else has ever come out. I doubt anything ever kind of will at this point because it's, you know, it's, he's called it dead for almost 20 years now. And it's going on 25 years of it being a thing. Um, almost 30 years. And uh, huh. the fact that nothing really else has come out here is, you know, kind of shows you that it's probably not going to. Really interesting. I have, uh, yeah, I've not heard about this at all. Um, I'd wonder uh, where Phil would fit in. Um, yeah, that, uh, really interesting. That was, yeah, because I mean, it's, it's, it's messed up, Phil, obviously, mm-hmm. and uh, it's right. So ninety six, ninety seven. So it's right after Trend Kill maybe right in that era. Um, and that's when Phil was among, at his, out of, out of, uh, you know, maybe at his worst possibly when he wasn't talking to anybody and he wasn't showing up anywhere and he was just in New Orleans alone. So that's a really interesting headspace, uh, Phil, obviously as well. And I think a lot of those down records, I think that's kind of that messed up Phil. Um, so yeah, it'd be really interesting to hear his voice and to hear what was going on, you know, on those records and on, on those songs, but yeah yeah especially with all three of their voices very distinct voices so that very that would have been really cool there is other things on youtube here are these not real i'm not gonna click them all i'll look i later. don't think any of them are really are, are real uh okay. i could be out of the loop on some of this possibly right. but i don't believe anything else is really out there for this stuff which is the the big deal because trent again to this day Maybe once a year, you'll have a blip of news pop up, and it's Trent Reznor talks tapeworm, and it's literally just every. <laughs> he just like this is the same line. He's like, it's just not a thing, you know. It was a lot of good, it wasn't great, and that's all it was. So yeah, it's not interesting. Yeah. Very cool. There you go. Learn something new every night. Every night. All right. Um, I'll go uh, kind of more in the vein of like a, like a black country communion type sound. Um, this is um, Smith and Cotton. So this is Adrian Smith and Richie Cotton. Wow. Uh, this is, uh, this is a record for 2021. I got this cause it's really cheap and uh, on Amazon, like a, a few months back and it's just, it's fit for this. So uh, uh, Adrian Smith of Iron Maiden, and Richie Cotson of now he's in the winery dogs who I, I don't really, I've never really listened to him, but they very well could have been on the list probably too. Um, 
and uh, he was in Poison and Mr. Big as well. Um, really cool little blues, hard rock stuff. Um, like if you're into that type of stuff, like there's nothing amazing on here, but if you like them, their guitar playing, which I love Adrian's guitar playing, his voice and uh, his songwriting, um, you, you're going to dig it. Uh, Nico plays drums on this for a track on Solar Fire. So there's a guest appearance by another Maiden member, so it's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, uh, I know Cotton plays drums on like most of the album too. So they're kind of sharing a lot of the different instruments and uh, they're really cool. They, their voices pair really well together. Um, and uh, they do a lot of seventies, like blues, hard rock influence. Uh, that's what they, they grew up on. And uh, yeah. So that's the Smith and Cotton. That's awesome. And that's the hype. And it's a really nice, uh, deep, deep red. I'll, I'll waste the time here. Pull it out because it's it's pretty cool. Nice. I like that. Yeah, really nice, deep, deep red. So, uh, check it out if you're into any type. If you're into Black Country or probably Winery Dogs uh, or any type of like '70s blues bass rock, you'll like it. If you're a Maiden fan and you're going into it to hear Iron Maiden, it's not. That's not nothing like Iron Maiden. Uh, Adrian's like doing stuff that influenced him when he was a kid. So it's nothing, nothing Iron Maiden like, but uh, yeah. if you appreciate, he's had some more of a pop sensibility and a lot of his and Bruce's. That's why I love him and Bruce. Uh, a lot of their songs are the more poppy catchy Maiden songs. And uh, a lot of that's in that wheel vein, but like their voices sound nothing like Bruce Dickinson. And it's got nothing like Steve Harris's bass on that. So, but it's definitely a, definitely worth a listen if you're a maiden fan it's an, it's at least a one time like oddity listen just to hear a different side of adrian so there you go nice that's cool yeah i didn't know they existed i also didn't know you had that that's a really cool i'm surprised it's cheap like i feel like that's so niche that i'd be a billion dollars nah it's like 19 bucks on amazon so nice. there you go it might be someday but yeah I, that's yeah. i could definitely see that because why are they gonna press it again right yeah. like it's, it's yeah yeah very very possible they won't so yeah money at some point so that's cool awesome f and a man all right so to piggyback back my piggyback to my piggyback uh <laughs> that i did there uh that we just did with tapeworm okay uh so again this walks the line but i'm i'm still calling it so whatever um so trent uh puts uh nine inch nails so 2009 Trent put Nine Inch Nails on hiatus and said, you know, don't really want to do this tour anymore and I don't want to make these records anymore. Mm -hmm. So he had been working on some things and no one knew what was going on. He had recently uh, gotten married to his wife, Mary Queen, and uh, they had started working on some stuff unbeknownst to people in the world. And in 2010, shortly after putting Nine Inch Nails to rest, put out... How to Destroy Angels, and they put an EP, and then it's Welcome Oblivion, I think, came out in 2011. Um, am I wrong about that? 2012. So, uh, it's it's uh, Trent Reznor, his wife, Mary Queen, uh, Atticus Ross, who later was just added. He always worked with Nine Inch Nails since 2000, but he later became an official member of Nine Inch Nails. And uh, also Rob Sheridan, who uh, did all the visuals for Nine Inch Nails, from 1998 uh, until 2014, I think he left. Um, so, but he's in the band. Um, I actually don't even know what Rob Sheridan did on this, besides all the artwork. <laughs> everything is very, he's very glitch art. That's his whole deal. Uh, like he's a okay. big, he's a big deal in that world. And I don't know if he's the first one to do it. He's probably not, but like, he's definitely, definitely like, I think he invented the VHS glitch art, which is what this is. So like it's tape on tape on tape, and he's just glitching gotcha. it on a a, a TV like a a, a, a a tube TV screen, whatever. And so I don't know if it's a hundred percent his invention, but I think it is, or uh, he was the first to do it. So anyway, um, it's a really cool band. Again, it walks the line here, so whatever. I'm I'm calling it fine, okay. but right. uh, the it's very much so like it definitely sounds like the more atmospheric quiet nine inch nails 
Uh, Mary Queen is very much so showcased on here as the lead vocalist. Trent does do vocals on here too, but it's a lot of Mary Queen and she has a great voice. Um, and Trent is obviously a major part of the production and the songwriting, obviously, and the music. So if you are a fan of Nine Inch Nails, it's definitely not a departure. Uh, it's just kind of a continuation, maybe a more mellowed out Nine Inch Nails. Um, and uh, I I was really impressed by this. I wish I would have bought the EP. The EP was, existed forever. It was a 10-inch. And mm. uh, I never bought it at Zia. And it was there forever. And Dylan bought a copy. And I just didn't because I'm stupid. And now that's hundreds of dollars, I believe. So that sucks. But uh, they put out the EP and they put out the record. Um, if you're into Nine Inch Nails, I'm sure you check this out. Um, there's a song called Drowning. That's one of my favorite <laughs> songs they ever did. It's just really, really cool. Uh, Mary Queen's vocal on there is, just sounds incredible. Um, me and Dylan actually went and saw them on their tour. They toured one oh. time and Dylan and I went to Vegas. That's my, it was my first time in Vegas. We went and saw them at the Palms, maybe, or I want to say, uh, in the, in the big ballroom or whatever. And it was one of the coolest shows I ever saw. Um, they did, uh, in their live set, they did a bunch of stuff. The nice shells, uh, obviously their live set and their production is, is a major, major thing. And Trent kind of brought that over to a certain extent with, uh, how to destroy angels. And they did the screens, like the, uh, the, basically it's the whole, all those little screens, whatever, in front of them. And they would constantly move throughout the performance. And you would see them on like camera and stuff. And you'd see the colors and you see all kinds of glitch everywhere or whatever. And it was really, really cool. Uh, so uh, I, I was impressed by that. It was one of the coolest shows I saw. Um, it was definitely the coolest show I had saw at that point because I'd never seen a production like that before. Um, and it was just, it was really awesome to see. And then obviously every time I've seen National since then, um, they've had, that's not true. The last, last tour was not as, as, as much production. That was the whole point of it. Uh, mm. but the, the, uh, the Hestation Marks had still had a little bit of that anyway. Very cool. Um, if you're in Nationals, if you're into atmospheric stuff, uh, Drowning is a, a song I would tell you to check out. Uh, this record, uh, it doesn't tickle all of my national fancy because I do like the aggressive, like the loud, like the crazy. This doesn't really border on that too much. Um, but it's for my money, it's still a pretty cool uh, addition to the national universe. So there you go. Out of Star Angels. Welcome to Oblivion. So. For the longest time, I didn't even know Trent was involved in that at all. I just remember hearing that name. Like, oh, wow. Like a, just thought it was like a new band. I don't even know when I knew that. I I want to say when the, like, I don't know when the announcement happened. I want to say it was a big deal, um, but it, it, I mean, they were a big deal to like the audience, to like the Nine Inch Nails fans, especially yeah. because they thought like Trent might not even bring this thing back. So this is kind of what sure. we got this whole Trent thing now. So like this is all we got. Mm -hmm. So they kind of developed themselves in that way. Um, so there's still a bunch of fandom for it. He still actually plays some songs live too every so often with Nine Inch Nails. He sneaks them in. Uh, which I appreciate because, you know, it's it's cool to hear him bring these songs back. And he loves his wife so much. Like, it's it's, it's crazy. So I, to give her a showcase, um, you know, on some of these sets, I think he, she's played with him a handful of times um, with the band. And it's just, it's it's a cool thing. So there you go. Gotcha. Very cool. Uh, I'm going to go with an album that was talked about for years and years. And uh kind of if you were a fan of this guy's band you were just anytime he brought this up you're like this is never gonna fucking happen uh this is ibaraki or Ibar ibaraki i don't know i might be pronouncing it wrong uh this is uh matt heafy's black metal side project matt heafy is from trivium he's the hmm. uh main singer songwriter guitarist in trivium uh long time metalcore metal thrash metal ish band and um from mid 2000s till today and this is now he talked about forever because matt's a big uh you know extreme metal fan he loves black death metal stuff he appreciates a lot of norwegian stuff and um uh, this is the album this came out in 2022 and this is something that like, i've been hearing about for like 10 12 years at this point nice. when it finally came out the album is uh rashomon very japanese influenced uh he is his mother's japanese he was born in japan um so uh he wears a lot of that that influences a lot of his work even in trivium as well um this is a really cool record 
Um, if you're a Trivium fan, you're probably not going to dig it. Uh, it is, it's very experimental. It's not all black metal. Um, the cool thing about that is Paulo from Trivium plays on this and Corey from Trivium plays on this. But the really fucking cool thing about that is he got uh, Isan from Emperor to produce this and oh, play wow. on this. And Matt is a giant Emperor fan. So to get that pull, to get him to actually do something outside of his world is, is a pretty big deal. He's a big name. So Isan produced this for him. He plays on this as well, plays guitar, does some vocals on it. Uh, Matt does a lot of vocals. He also, like, my first exposure to this is Ronin. They, it was one of the lead singles, track eight. Gerard Way's on this and from My Chemical Romance. And I went into that, listening to that song, and I was like, what, what, is, what is he going to do on here? And the song starts, and I'll just play the song for Tyler because it's it's a really it's a really good song, yeah. and it's really it's really impressive. Um, uh, Gerard is really impressive, and I want to see him explore this. Uh, in my camera, a different band or whatever, I don't yeah. care. But uh, so this is a little bit. I won't play the whole song. It's nine minutes, but. Uh, Oh, Matt. I'm like, I know Matt. I thought you were in the team. And Matt was going to do the extreme vocals. So I'm like, okay. This is Matt. So is Gerard also going to do extreme vocals? And then... Like, a lot of it's this. It's very kind of atmospheric. and But it's got some really intense, heavy moments throughout the record, too. Uh, let's this is actually Isan's family too does like the chorus part of this I think his wife and his kids and then this hits and I was like this is Gerard Way, and then Matt actually comments on here. And Gerard did, did all the Gerard did all the screams on this. Uh, Isan is on the solo. Isan's family on the woes. Yours truly on singing. Alex Bent on drums. Wow, I've listened to a lot of black metal. This is a really good black metal vocal. That's crazy. So, yeah. Turned you on your on your ass, brother. Yeah. Wow. Really cool That's record. Cool. It has a lot. I dig that. Has a lot of moments like that. Um, there's actually uh, parts of this too that samples Final Fantasy VII sound effects too. So. It was, it's down with that, obviously. Yeah, oh yeah. And you can, you can like barely you can barely catch it. Like it's very subtle. Oh uh, really? And yeah, it's like the first time I listened to this, I had it playing, and I thought I had Twitch up in the background because I'm if I'm I usually have a, like a Final Fantasy VII speed run going a lot of the times if I'm doing anything online, and just on in the background, and like I heard sound effects for Magic, and I'm like, do I have Twitch up? And I'm like, no. I'm like, this is in the song. So pretty cool record. Uh, Nuclear Blast put this out, which I find interesting. I don't know why uh, Roadrunner didn't want anything to do with it, because trivia has been on Roadrunner forever. But uh, there's your gatefold. And, nice. Uh, the LPs themselves are a really cool clear with white and black and red. Wow. Splatter. So, uh, cool album. Check it out, even if you're not into black metal. Uh, you could really get into it. Nergal's on this record too from uh, Behemoth. So I was gonna say who else on the record? Uh, that's it. Uh, Nergal, Isan, Corey, and Paulo from Trivium, uh, Gerard Way, and uh, Isan's family, which is really yeah. cool. So yeah, that's cool. Nice. Um, I did look it up. So I don't know what the whole content of the record is, but the band is Wild Wild Trees or Thorny Thorny Trees. Is what the 
what your ear box your ear docky means oh okay so i don't know if it's a very okay. like uh environmental record maybe i don't know but yeah yeah maybe i'd have to dive into lyrics which i haven't but um yeah all the japanese all the uh, song titles are in japanese too so oh okay um, that's old yeah, so you gotta even go, gotta go even deeper there. Uh, check it out though. Like, I think you'd probably dig it too. It'd be like a- that's yeah. That's, I I really didn't know. Obviously, I didn't know that existed. But I I feel like the fact because anything Gerard does, like again, like that that band and my chem and Gerard, like they're a god to so many people uh, that are still you know active in the scene or whatever, right? and uh, fans and stuff so i'm really surprised that never got like that never got my radar at all um and yeah i mean just the, 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 just the fact that he was doing those vocals that would be a big deal to like a lot of people if he was doing it the video is good like it, it, i mean it's got it's got five hundred thousand views so it's pretty solid in a year for sure it's nothing crazy i know trivium's got way more and obviously my cam has got way more but yeah. um there's a lot of people that comment on it, like, "Oh, I'm a big Mike Hem fan. This uh, this brought me here, and I really dig it." So maybe That's they'll awesome. check out Trivium and shit. So it worked out for Matt. Like Matt's a really Matt's really smart about that. I I follow him on Instagram and I follow him on Twitch, and he's big into Twitch, and he does Where a radio show from? on Liquid Metal. What's up? Where are Trivium from? They're formed in Florida, Orlando. Okay. All right, I was gonna say because like because um, they I know Mike comes up in New York, New Jersey, so I didn't know if that was if they have the connection there at all. But I have no idea how they hooked up. I have no yeah. idea. I didn't look that far into it, um, so I don't know. I know they maybe they played a fest somewhere together or something. I have no idea. I'm sure they cross paths. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. All right. So another one that I had here. I've shown this all before, but I don't care because it has to be uh, happen again. So when I said that that Boxcar was my favorite side project record, probably number one that I was going to talk about, I realized I was lying uh, about very shortly after I said that. Uh, <laughs> this is my favorite because it's one of my top five records of all time. I love this record. I cannot. I, I will listen to this once a month. Uh, wow. So this is uh, Brian Fallon from Gaslight Anthem and Ian Perkins from Quorum Gaslight Anthem. We looked this up before because I've talked about this record before. Whatever, so I won't have to go. I won't wax on about it too long. But The mm-hmm. Horrible Crows and Elsie. This is 2013? 2000 and... Yeah, 13 because, la- because this year was the, t- was the 10 year. So yeah, 2013. Maybe 2012 possibly because maybe last year was the 10 year. I forget. But anyway, um, this is... Uh, yeah, it's Brian Brian Fallon from Gaslight Anthem, twenty eleven. Twenty eleven. Oh wow, so so interesting. Okay, so eh. twenty twenty one was the ten year. Wow. Yeah. It's um. Yeah. All right. So Elsie, um, I love this record so much. I don't necessarily like Gaslight even half as much as like the, like this record. Um, Gaslight's fine. I know that's a life band for a lot of people. Like uh, that like the the punk rock rock and roll thing like you know uh, just that sound um it's cool i like some songs uh some records are cool but for my money this is the best thing that brian fallon's ever done uh this is more uh toned back uh it's a it's a it's more it's a, there's a lot of quiet parts on this record uh, acoustic uh, songs um piano on the record um just great songwriting very emotional um it's it's yeah it's really heart-wrenching um Behold the Hurricane, one of my favorite songs. Um, I I can't get enough of can't get enough of, of his of his emotional songwriting on this. Like any breakup or like hard feelings that I've had here in the last like ten years or whatever the hell, definitely leaned on this record a lot. Um, so Last Rites, super cool song. Uh, Behold the Hurricane, great. Uh, Lady Killer, another great song. Um, Go tell everybody. I. It's it, it's it's just it's kind of old timey and not old timey but it's it's just it, they're rock songs but they're just a little more you know laid back uh, toned down. Uh, I witnessed a crime, another great song. So it's I mean they're all good. But um, if you're into Gaslight Anthem, if you're into um, just that kind of like you know low key rock and roll stuff, I would definitely check recommend checking it out. Um, for my money, best thing he's ever done. I like his solo records too. But I'd still always come back to Whole Crows. Um, was lucky enough to meet him, see him, see him do this, uh, do a lot of these songs live. 
that was a big highlight. Talked about that before the channel, talked about the show and everything else or whatever many times. So uh, probably two or three times at this point. So if you want to go back and look at other things, go do it. Um, so yeah, this is the record gatefold, uh, just the lyrics and such. And then on this, I want to say it's red. Uh, yes, it is oh, red. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. There you go. So if oh, yeah. you have not already, would recommend checking it out. That is the Horrible Crows and Elsie. Uh, I like that album go- cover too. No, yeah, it's 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 real cool. It's just it's, it's got that like know. old school kind of like yeah, the block lettering and stuff. Like a blue note jazz vibe or something to it. It's cool. Absolutely, hundred percent. Um, they did a live record live from the Troubadour as well, and uh, that's one of my favorite live records, you know, ever too because it's just it sounds so good and it's shot. There's a DVD in, in it too, and it's shot so well. He also covers Katy Perry "Teenage Dream" on there, and uh, just on the guitar, and uh, it's a great cover so yeah there you go anyway gaslight or nope uh, horrible crows elsie there you go boom nice uh i'm gonna do one i haven't talked about on this channel I'll probably never will i don't own this uh and this is another big one that i remembered from this topic so i appreciate that because i listened to this record like five or six times <laughs> and nice. uh it's it's still absolutely stellar from 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 when i remember it so uh the band uh, is very simply titled I. And um, the band is a Norwegian black metal supergroup. They formed in uh, 2006. And uh, the band is a bot from Immortal. Uh, Armageddon, who was Immortal's original drummer. Uh, Gorgoroth bassist T.C. King and Enslaved guitarist Ice Dale. Wow. And Demon Oz from immortal wrote all the uh lyrics for the album they did one album 2006 the album's called between two worlds and we'll play a little bit of it here um this is black black and roll like it's it's motorhead inspired kids inspired uh just heavy metal classic rock inspired black metal really great album really just top to bottom sick album great riffs uh cool vocals This is the full album. Luckily, this is on Spotify too. Got the whole thing, and its feature says "Cool Immortal" about riffs, but uh, through like a Motorhead lens. Yeah. And you get you get a little bit epic too. Uh, this is the storm I ride. This is the first song on the album. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Days of North Winds. This song's pretty cool. It's got some more epicness to it. Really nice drum sound. I hadn't thought about this record over 10 years. Wow. And then what when I was researching, it? this is 06. Okay. I like it because it's just, it's a lot of immortal, but it's just different enough to where it necessitates its existence. Yeah. So. Yeah, really cool. Just simply titled I, and the album is Between Two Worlds from 06. Um, I looked it up on Discogs. There was one 06 pressing that's for vinyl. That's like a couple hundred bucks. And then there's uh, the CD even will run you like uh, 20 to $50. Wow. Nice. So, so I might break down and buy the CD. I don't think this will ever get repressed. It's Nuclear Blast, so it might someday. It just seems like it's totally been forgotten about. Have you ever um, looked, probably? Because you forgot about it all together, but have you ever looked for, uh, at D or anything? No, I've never looked for it. And it, yeah. well, it hasn't been expressed since 06, so. Yeah, that's fair. If they ever get a copy, if they know what it is, it'll be on the wall. And so. Oh, that's uh, fair, I guess. You're right. It'll be, or yeah. in the case or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a couple hundred dollars, so. Yeah. Oh, I meant the CD. Band, I'm sorry, so. the CD. That's what I meant. I meant the CD or whatever. Oh, the CD? I, yeah. I mean, 
recently no because honestly i just remembered it in the last week yeah, you forgot. so i'll start looking again if it does show up i usually i tend to look through the immortal stuff to yeah. see if there's any like old 90s pressings that i'll ever probably never find but you never know so uh so yeah hopefully no i dig that i'm gonna check that out i'm gonna legitimately check that out i dig that a lot it's on like, spotify just if you can't find it just go to immortal and go to uh similar artists or whatever because it's kind of oh, they find. actually are on the similar artists they don't they actually did it right for that's nice yes, they are. yeah what a concept yeah. what a concept yeah. spotify yeah. i know you're watching but you know yeah Jesus Christ. all right that's awesome good stuff all right uh so do let's do another i got two more i don't know how many else how many more you got uh we got seven more okay i hope we can run through yours too that's fine yeah all right but... uh, i got three more i lied to you. you got three more all right okay so uh another heavy hitter here that i've talked about before so again i'm not going to wax on too long about this but i have to bring it up because this is a very yeah i have to and i love this record so much uh give up post service talked about this like three times now at this point uh it's jimmy from dentel it's uh ben gibbard from uh from death cab jenny lewis from jenny lewis uh made a record in 2003 uh it's one of my favorite records of all time uh like legitimately maybe top 15 maybe i don't know um and uh it's just it's ben gibbard with electric electro sounds in the background uh programming and what have you uh some guitar on it mostly just uh, the programming um very emotional uh very <sighs> it's still different like this went platinum so it's still mm -hmm. different enough from death cab like way different enough that like i think people that aren't into death cab necessarily would be into this and vice versa maybe um maybe they're not maybe they're super into death cab not into this i don't know but um i was obsessed with this record the first time i heard it uh probably it came out in 03 i probably heard it maybe end of 04 early 05 kind of middle school high school uh such great heights was the big song off here everyone's heard that song because it was everywhere for years iron and wine did a, did a cover of it that was a big deal for people as well uh big myspace songs on here uh so if you're into death cab um for cutie or dentel or jenny lewis for that matter check it out they're going to do a 20 year anniversary this year and uh, their tickets are squillions of dollars so it's 20 year for this and for transatlanticism from death cab they're doing a dual tour so it'd be amazing to go to that show but to go get respectable tickets at dodge theater here uh, i think we're looking at like three or four bills so kind of just insane um but i mean this record wasn't they were never supposed to make an uh, make another record uh, but they're also never supposed to tour this so like they were never supposed to do anything with this at all and ben Gerber would, would routinely get mad anybody ever brought this up brought the project up whatever he'd get upset because he's like that happened once don't worry about it i'm still <laughs> doing other stuff death cab still exists so whatever right so they eventually dusted off the 10 year now for the 20 year and uh maybe if i win the lottery in the next few months go to the show uh but mm. yeah so great heights district sleeps alone tonight big song um uh, you got Clark Gable and We Will Become Sil Silhouettes, Brand New Colony. Just perfect. Perfect record, top to bottom. If you haven't checked it out, you're insane. Check them out. Uh, this is the special, like, out of, like, 200 uh, air pressing, I guess. Like, Blue Cloud or Cloud oh, nice. Air, I don't know what to call it, but from that Zia did a couple years ago. So, there you go. Uh, uh, Post-service, give up. Perfect. Uh, brought up a few times now. And uh, it deserves you brought it up every time. So there we go. Boom. Nice. Yeah. Um, I got five more. I'll do five. I'll, I'll remove two because we're already going. We're going long tonight anyway. It's Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> the feeling's right. So. Um, well, actually, it's Saturday morning right now, just technically, but either way. Very true. You get bonus, Magnaflow bonus time here on the uh, <laughs> Wax podcast. Shout out. Uh, Thank Tyler for that because he put we puts back till Friday. So um, we would have done this anyway. We would have done, done this Wednesday. So don't worry about it. I wouldn't have went overtime. I would have even cut this shit off. If you hadn't gotten there, you wouldn't know what to do. So don't worry about it. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go with a a really cool side project album that was like many years in the making and finally came out. Like, when did he do this? Like oh five or something? No, Two thousand. I'm way off. Um, this is the Iomi solo record, uh, Iomi, 
and I do not own this, but I'll play a little bit of the Peter Steele song. So this is a cool album because he kind of Tony Iommi did from Black Sabbath did what he wanted to do in the eighties when they made him do the seven, when the label made him do the seven star album. Uh, Cause the seven star album was originally going to just going to have a, a different vocalist on every song. Yeah. And then the label was like, no, you need a vocalist. Like let's do this as a Sabbath album. So that's how Glenn Hughes ended up in Black Sabbath. And so he did the whole seven star album with Glenn Hughes. It was originally just going to be him playing with a bunch of guest vocalists. So this record has a bunch of different people. It's got Henry Rollins on it. Uh, it's got Dave Grohl and Brian May. It's got Phil Anselmo. Matt Cameron plays drums on a lot. It's got Surge on a song from System. Billy Corgan. Uh, Ian Asbury from The Cult. Uh, Peter Steele, which is the song I'll play, which is a really cool song. Ozzy's on this. Uh, with Bill Ward as well, uh, nice. playing drums. And then you got a Billy Idol song too. So, uh, yeah. Um, I actually got Geezer's book and I, I flipped through a page. It just came out la- this week and I was oh. flipping through. I flipped to a page and uh, one of the things was like him and Tony on the outs and stuff. So I'm interested to read it. I'm disappointed that it's only like 300 pages long, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how good it is. Uh, anyways, I'm going to play a little of this song, Just Say No to Love. Uh, this is the song with Peter Steele on it, and this is a really cool track. Kind of a typo vibe. And he's a big Sabbath fan, obviously. Yeah. So kind of a cool like typo intro here. You could definitely hear this on a typo record. Yeah. And then you get the fucking master. Yeah, really cool song. If you're uh, looking for any like Sabbathy stuff to listen to, I highly recommend that record. Another record that I forgot about really until doing this, and uh, it's like, yeah, let's listen to that. It's really cool to listen. Um, I don't think I found it on Spotify. Okay. So uh, if you want to check it out, I think you got to find the YouTube rip. So there you go, Tony Iommi with the Iommi album. Yeah, I don't think I think you're correct. I don't yeah, it's not on here at all. So yeah, that is that is a YouTube exclusive there for you. Uh if you want to go and check that one out. Um yeah. yeah, that's that's not so no, I like that. That's cool. I always like um people going on going doing crazy stuff outside right now. Uh I always right. like that when uh I mean obviously there's some stuff is better than others, but uh when dudes bring in just a bunch of guest vocalists and guests, you know, collaborators on records stuff like that, like special one-offs, I think it's always kind of cool. And, uh, you know, they usually choose the best, the best, you know, uh, of those, you know, major names. Right. Yeah. Um, it's cool to hear, it's cool to hear Peter, Peter Steele work on a Sabbath song or, you know, the, the sound of Sabbath. It's really cool. Uh, it's yeah. cool to hear those, you know, just those vocals and hear those collaborators go on. Um, yeah, it's, that's good stuff. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's a good track. The whole album's really good. That's my favorite track by far. But uh, there you go. What what All you right. got? All right, so I have another one here that I forgot about a little bit. Uh, they've done so much over the last like I just looked because I I really forgot how much stuff they've actually put out. They've put out so many records. There's like six records out now. Uh, I'm only a fan of the first two. Because I just haven't listened to the rest of it, but whatever. Anyway, so one of her bands of all time is AFI, uh, Jade Puget, uh, Puget, Puget, and Davey Havoc, lead singer and the uh, lead guitarist. Um, well, Jade's lead guitarist, Dave's lead singer. Anyway, whatever. So they uh, are into a lot of different sounds, as AFI is the showcase of, right? Well, even more than what AFI does, they're into uh, dance and electronic music. So in 01, they started working on. Uh, songs that were not in any way shape or form even they were too weird for afi at that point still because that was still that's pre 
uh, Sing of Sorrows that's pretty mainstream. That's just coming off of Art of Drowning, really. So that was that kind of them putting the toes into the kind of the more mainstream sound. Um, and so they were not prepared to do any kind of pop stuff at all. Well, uh, comes around 2007, uh, coming off of December Underground in 06, which was very, very poppy. And uh, probably their biggest record by sales numbers, I would assume. Uh, they decided to finally put out that band, that band being Black Audio and that record being mm. Sex Sells. So um, this is the second record, uh, Bright Black Heaven. Uh, I like this record enough. It's fine. Sex Sells is is the record, though. Like, I listened to that CD. I don't have it anymore. I don't know what happened to it. I think I might have, I might have just wore it out. I don't know. Broke it. I don't okay. know. But uh, it's so good. Sex Sells is so good. The song Stiff Kittens off that record. It's the first lead single. I, I cannot get enough of that song. I listened to that a bunch. Uh over the last few days uh i forgot how good it was because back then uh, like i i truly truly like can't tell you how many times went through uh hanging out with jake that's so cool listen like immediately wait for it right here it's gonna break in immediately almost Okay, it goes, it goes on. Hold on. Hold on. There we go. And then it goes on. Okay, whatever. So Thanks. Davey's vocal on this song is super dark, super deep. And yeah. it's very, very, like, gothy. And, Dude, it's uh, best Peter. Exactly. No, 100%. So, like, I was not perceptive of that at the time, obviously. Um, and then he goes up. He goes with his high vocal. This is cool. Stuff. I like this. Yeah. It's it's very, I mean, it's very, it's, I mean, sex sells, right? Um, but uh, then the soaring chorus. So sick! It just sounds like a lot of '80s goth and stuff. '80s yeah, dance, yeah. whatever, right? So uh, this this record, top to bottom for me, is the Black Audio record. I listen to that. Like, I haven't actually listened to that in a lot while. So this is the first time I really, uh, this last week or so, I really thought about it again. Um, but this is the second record. Um, it's cool. It's fine. And now they've put out three or four more on top of this the last few years. So just fucking insanity. Um, I, I need to check them out. I just haven't. Uh, but if you're into AFI, if you're into dance pop, if you're into gothy stuff, if you're into synth, if you're into any of that stuff, Davey's vocals, because his vocals probably sound the best on these records. Uh, that they've sounded in a long time, um, especially with new AFI stuff. But uh, not that they sound bad; it's just different. And uh, I would I would definitely recommend checking it out. They're massive, massive dance pop fans, so like they kind of lean on those influences a lot from from the '80s and stuff and uh, electronic music. So if you're a fan of it, check it out. Uh, I was really excited to listen to the record again. The next song, uh, Between Br- Breaths, also another cool song, Snuff on Digital. Like I listen to this constantly because buddy Jake, we would drive around at night and in the in the in the old Stratus and just blast this CD constantly after it came out because he's a massive A5 fan. So like it was my first ever exposure to like that kind of wave of music, I guess, like just the dance pop and like the gothy stuff. It was the first time I ever listened to that. So uh I was I was really impressed with it. And I wish they had put that on a vinyl. They never have. I wish they would. Um, oh wow. So if that ever came out, I don't know. It's it's on, uh, I think it's on DreamWorks still, or maybe Warner or Interscope. Maybe it's on Interscope. Um, so I doubt that it'll ever kind of come out. Maybe, uh, but one can dream. They they just put out uh, Sing the Sorrow after saying they wouldn't for years, and apparently, supposedly, there's a December Underground repress coming out too. So oh, wow. uh, again, but that's unconfirmed. People think it's a boot. Nobody really knows at this point. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Um, but yeah, so they are repressing vinyl, maybe. Uh, so if you're if you're looking for that stuff, be on the lookout, and uh, you might be able to get it. Yeah. I actually should be getting my either two or three copies of Sing the Sorry or pretty quick. So in the next like gotcha. week or two, I don't remember. I think at the end of June it's supposed to ship possibly. So okay. uh, we'll see. I might uh, on the next pickups video whenever we do that, I'll have a couple couple few copies of the of that uh, after so many years and at that time. Nice. 
So there you go. That's cool. So I wonder if Anna knows that is because she'd really dig that. I actually, so I have a, I have a memory here of me talking to your wife about this in one of our classes, because I want to say like, I think she knows who it is. I think she knew something or other from somebody. Yeah, sure. I want to say we talked about that record at one point in time. So I think she might. Yeah. I think she might know. Yeah, I don't think she's a huge AFI fan. Like, I think she likes those, like, the big, like, December Underground yeah. and Sing Star. I, I know think she that, knows what that, those are, so. That came into her world at some point, some way or another, I think, uh, you know, back then. It's 2006, 2007, so, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I'm going to go with one that is a side project. I was very hyped for when it came out. The last two records that he put out, I was, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't like, give him a fair shake, so I needed to really listen to him. Uh, but that is uh, me and that man. So this is uh, Nergal's uh, like kind of country western blues side project. Uh, this is the first record came out in 2017. Uh, this is Songs of Love and Death. Uh, he did this with a um, Polish singer songwriter John Porter. Interesting. Uh, there's John and Nergal on that side. And then uh, this is a really cool. This is this survived the purge uh, when I sold everything off, which I'm very happy that I kept it because this is uh, very expensive now. Like I want to say this is like a couple hundred bucks. Nice. This is like the web the web store variant. Uh, and then he put out it's like a blue smoke, uh, very cool variant there. And this actually uh, should. Oh, you know, it's not in here. This came with a, a frame, a, a framed up, basically the cover, uh, not framed, but a signed kind of basically like the cover. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, it's a LP size uh, picture of John and Nergal, and it's signed. I have nice. it framed. That's I was like, it's not in here, but then I realized I have it framed. Oh, okay, so okay, yeah. that's why it's not in here. Um, so, so yeah, I was uh very stoked to get that. And then I'll play a little of it because it's really interesting. It's a cool, it's a cool concept. Um, if you know, if you know anything about Nergal, like he's in Behemoth, they're a black and death metal band, so it's a very heavy, you know, very intense all the time usually. So uh, this is definitely a uh, different wheelhouse. So this song is called "Ain't Much Lovin." Just play a little bit. This kind of give you the whole vibe for the whole album, really. I know the new album has a lot of specials. They get Matt Matt Heafy's on the new album from Trivium. Mm-hmm. Corey Taylor's on there. Uh, a bunch of big names are on the newer ones. So it's really weird to hear him sing clean. Uh, very rarely does Behemoth ever have any clean vocals. So. I like John's voice too. Kind of yeah. Johnny Cash stuff. Got that hollow body sound. It's cool. It's cool stuff. Yeah. Very different if you know anything about Behemoth. Yeah. Uh, very, very, very different. Uh, no, a lot of it. like, a lot of cool, uh, like if you're into like erotic videos and shit, a lot of really, this is like a very tame video. A lot of their videos are, are not tame at all. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a uh, it's interesting, definitely interesting, definitely different, and I gotta give the newer stuff a chance because I just haven't. Really. Yeah, that's cr- I've never really uh, obviously I didn't know that existed, but um, I've never really heard f- like foreign like European country. Uh, so hearing any sort of like Western sure, yeah, music with a with an accent kind of takes you like in a different place. It's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely that American early country done through a uh, European Polish 
lens. lens. So yeah, yeah. like I'm it's weird. Keith anyway. Urban's Australian, right? So like that's weird. Imagine <laughs> got got Polish, got Polacks over there doing some stuff. That's interesting. Yeah, exactly. Hundred percent. F and A. That's cool. I don't know. I dig that a lot. I also dig just like the dichotomy of that too. Like just the two polar opposite. You know, literally probably as far apart as you can possibly get on the spectrum. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sound, right? um, Definitely. Just that's I like that. I dig that. I, I do both. You can do both. You know, you do both. That's awesome. I like it. Yeah. I know a lot of people gave him shit, but uh, whatever. I don't care. Just do what you want to do. You don't have to listen to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's dumb. Like, if he wants to do – it's so different that I don't know how you're giving him yeah. shit because it's so different. And it's not like that – it's not like that's going to pack a stadium. He didn't sell out. Like, he's not, like, doing a pop record, like, whatever you want to say. Like, he's just – it's so different. You have to respect it. Like, I don't think he just wanted to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, I agree with you. Yeah. All right. Um, last one here. Uh, this is uh, already talked about him, but now this is his solo uh, project, side project. Uh, this is a band called Right Away Great Captain, and it's the solo project of one Andy Hole from Manchester Orchestra. Uh, so this is the Big Book trilogy. I have four copies of this at this point. Uh, he's put out different variants and stuff, and so I have all of those. This is uh, maybe two. This is this, like, I don't think it's the newest variant. It might be the variant before. Uh, it's very well well done. Uh, it's the big book and uh, has all the records in there with all the artwork and stuff, and uh, just the pages and whatever. And just it just it's that's awesome. nice. Real thick, real heavy. Probably one of the better produced things that they've done in this way because they don't really do too much with their i should say that but it's uh it's yeah it's 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 really it's really nicely done um so it's the trilogy so it's all three records it's the bitter end it's eventually home and then the church of the good thief uh it's a concept trilogy it's all about uh the basic story is a it's uh 1800s it's a sailor goes off to war and uh his wife starts living with his brother and he comes back to find his wife and his brother together he kills his brother and uh i can't if he kills his wife i forget now uh the whole story all the ins and outs here but um it's it's really cool uh it's it's very it's just it's just acoustic it's very quiet and uh there's there's very little on here besides the acoustic guitar some piano at points uh there's a lot of cool stuff on here um it's it's not necessarily as accessible as maybe what manchester you know would be and what he normally does acoustically with the, within that band but uh within the story i i really dig it it's been a while since i went through the went through the trilogy here honestly uh he's put out uh, a live record for the band uh that he did again just solo acoustic and uh he put out some demos and stuff and supposedly maybe is working on a chapter four uh, for this uh, in some way, shape, or form. He doesn't really know what's going on. He doesn't know how he's going to do it, but he wants to do something rather, maybe a prequel kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, if you're into a three-part concept record about uh, 1800s war sailors, all that kind of stuff, check it out. Um, it's very lo-fi. It's very, it's very you know, raw. Uh, it's very rough sounding in certain parts. Uh, he rec- he recorded the first record uh, for basically no money in a cabin in the woods and uh, kind of, you know, kept that sound ish for the rest of it. More polished as it went on, but still kept that, you know, that core, you know, tenant. Um, for my money, there's there is some highlights here for some songs. If you want the highlights of the songs here, uh, O Deceiver that opens up the entire trilogy. Uh, right away, Captain kicks that off. It's kind of like a more there's actually hooks and stuff in that song. Um, and then uh, Devil Dressed in Blue, another big one. Uh, oh no, I tried. I'm a vampire with a cage. Uh, I wait for you. Blame was a big song, and we are made out of lightning. Uh, I've seen him do all these songs uh, live, uh, solo, uh, acoustically, and they kill. They're they're absolutely incredible. Um, it's not my favorite thing he does uh, by any means. I still really like it. It's not my favorite thing he does. But I appreciate it for what it is, um, and uh, there's there's a, definitely an audience for this that like this more than they like his Manchester stuff, which is really interesting to me. 
it's each their own. People have different tastes and stuff like that. But there's definitely people that have found Manchester through this, which is super crazy to me. Mm. Think of this yeah. came afterwards, and uh, very shortly thereafter, very shortly after the first record came out, uh, 07. So, uh, yeah, it's it's funny. Like, I, I, uh, I used to know a girl that had no idea that Andy from – or from Rugby for Captain, he didn't know his name or anything. She had no idea that he was the guy from Manchester. I had no clue. I was on her playlist wow. driving around, and she was like, I like this a lot. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's Andy from Manchester, my guy. And she was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, it's a guy, same guy, same same guy. And she's like, no, it's not. And I was like, it is. It's literally the same person. I don't know what we're talking about. It's that <laughs> and we listened to both, and she was like, oh, I guess it is. I was like, yeah, I don't. why would I lie to you? I don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. uh, but, uh, yeah, so anyway. Um, if you're into Manchester Orchestra and you like Andy's voice and you like what he does with acoustic guitar and songwriting, uh, is story based uh, concept songwriting, check it out. Uh, it's it's a cool stuff. Again, not my favorite thing he does, but it's still really good, and I still appreciate it for what it is. So there you go. Right away for Captain, all the records, the whole thing by a trilogy. He does a repressing of this every two years or so. So if you don't have one yet, it's all really expensive. They're all hundreds of dollars. Uh, just hold out for a little bit. He'll press more at some point. So there you go. Quick question. I'm trying to think of a band. I don't know if I have a comparable thing. Okay. Um, your favorite band, yep. like he's got two side projects. Like Andy's got two side projects. Yep. As a fan, do you like the fact that you're getting a different side or do you think, well, why aren't, why aren't you just working on a new Manchester record? No, no. Cause like, um, Maybe if it wasn't always the case, right? But he was always doing other stuff. So, like, it's ne he's never okay. just done the band, right? So, like, if that was the situation at any point in time, maybe I'd feel that way. But, like, it's, I mean, it, like, Tom, for example. Tom never did shit. He didn't do solo records. He didn't do Angels and Airwaves and stuff, whatever. That was never a priority for him. So, like, when you go back to Blink the first time and you put off doing the record for two years... And uh, you constantly put out Angel and Airways records and, and songs and singles and stuff in the time it takes you to make a Blink record. That pisses me off because that's not how you did business. And it also sucks because that shit sucks. Uh, so with Andy doing other stuff, he's always done other stuff. Okay. I like it. Uh, I also know that he's going to probably do a tour on it and do some shows here and there. And I'll have another chance mm. to see him or see the bands that he's doing and stuff like that. So I appreciate that. Um, but uh yeah, again, if it was if it was not always the way it was, maybe I'd feel that way, but since I've never really known anything differently, you know. So for that I gotcha. project, I guess. So yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And they're How do you... are they are they well, I don't really know if I have an, a necessary uh a really comparable comparison. Okay. But yes. are they are they different enough for you to necessitate them? If they're oh, different yeah. enough, I'm oh, fine. Here. Like like the Nergal project we just played. If that sounded like Behemoth, I just I wouldn't be into it. Like just play Behemoth shit. Like I don't know, yeah. just do a Behemoth record. So yeah. no, um, if, if things sound like the primary band, it always kind of like appear like just like yeah. the Blink, just like Boxcar. It seems like you're making a statement here, whether it's intentional sure. or not. You're making yeah. a similar enough sound without certain folks involved. You're trying to say something whether you want to or not uh so yeah no it's very different it's it, they're uh, uh, like like bad books is very different with kevin's uh take on it his vocal his guitar work like it's very different and uh, the, the the quirkiness maybe of the sound i wouldn't say it's like cute it made it a little cutesy it's not like fun or anything like that it's a little cutesy little kevin stuff makes it a little, a little more different and that's the entire band or was at one point plus kevin uh with okay. uh right away your captain it's totally it's all stripped back very lo-fi, very acoustic. Like there's nothing else going on with it, just his vocal and the guitar. So yeah, it's 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 a lot different than what most Manchester. There's the Manchester solo acoustic stuff, obviously too, but it's not anything like like what the what Great Captain is. Okay, yeah, I was trying to think of a comparable one. Like I guess if because the Bruce the, the Dickinson solo album that this you know new new solo album they've been talking he's been talking about there for like ten years. Yeah, and I get it, you know we're working on it. Me and Roy Z are in the studio. Blah blah blah. If they finally, um, if he finally did it, I would. It'd be weird because I'd be more excited for that than a new Maiden album. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's it's been so long, and Bruce was doing better records in the '90s than Maiden. 
So yeah. I'd be really interested to see what he could do without Steve uh, now. So I don't know. Like the Adrian Smith album, like Maiden's still going to do an album. Like, yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's not it's not taking away from anything. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I have a comparable comparison. But the, the Bruce album, if Bruce's album ever comes out, I'm definitely going to be way more excited for that than I am any new Maiden record. Yeah. A, because we've gotten more Maiden records. And B... I like Bruce's songwriting more than Steve's and we get more Steve's songs than anybody else. So, yeah, yeah, um, no, for sure. It's like, yeah. we, we talked before, like in a, in a negative way. Cause there's people like, like there's not, we don't care necessarily, but like all the system bands sound like system, yes. like 6am sounds like crew. So yes. like, it's, it's just the same shit. And when that's the case, you just kind of tune out. Cause you're like, cause again, you're trying to say something. I know like with the system stuff, they broke up or they won't make new, new songs or whatever, but they're all doing their, they're all doing their own version of it. Uh, it kind of, and then, you know, it either shows a lack of creativity or, or you just don't care enough to try to do something different. <laughs> you're right. Or, or the mean, labels telling you, you have to sound like this and you're just saying, okay, I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I guess like if that's your sound, that's your sound, but like, why don't you just do your band because you hate each other because you don't want to deal with that guy anymore. That's all it is. And and if you you actually say that's not the case, like you're fucking lying. Like you're just a liar Mm. because why would you make this record? It just absent the dude. It's absent the guy or the two guys or whatever, but you're still still the same sound. It's the same songs, the same topics or whatever the hell, like the 6am thing. Like that is funny because literally the last crew record the real last crew record is just a 6 a.m record literally the 6 a.m record the guy wrote it like dj ashball wrote the record with 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 uh with nikki and that's what became the record handed it to vince they sang it and did the whole thing that's the entire record it's hilarious that it was such a derivative thing that you actually were able to bring in somebody to write a crew record because they were writing it primarily for their other band hilarious Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's other examples out there like that, but that's oh, yeah, just off the top of my head. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good little sidebar. I'll wrap this up here. I got one. I got, I'll do three more, but one yeah. really quick one. And then two, like two big ones. So this is elegant weapons. This just came out like two weeks ago. This is Richie Faulkner's new band, Richie Faulkner from Judas Priest. Uh, this is a really cool record. Ronnie Romero sings on us. Ronnie Romero is in, he's still in rainbow and rainbow doesn't do anything. So, and he sounds a lot like Ronnie James Dio. Um, Ronnie Romero is a really good singer. I love Richie's guitar playing. I loved him on Firepower, uh, the last Priest record. I love him live. Um, I think he's one of the best Priest members, like, in the band (laughs) today. Um, And uh, this is a really cool record. I I wanted to support it. Uh, Elegant Weapons, Horns for a Halo. Uh, Scott Travis is on drums from Judas Priest. And uh, Rex Brown from Pantera plays bass. Oh, wow. on this album they're not in the touring band but they were on the album so um one of the bass players from uriah heap and the uh the drummers from except i think the current drummer except really cool album uh just good hard rock uh it's it's not priest because ronnie ramirez a way to singer than halford he's way more bluesy kind of way more do than halford yeah he's he's way more down here than up here all the time uh but really really cool stuff i was i was just checking out if you're into priest or any type of good like 80s metal it's definitely that sound hell yeah um that's like brand new and then let's do this one next so so i the black metal project was probably my favorite one these are probably like my next like one a one b or one c or whatever so uh we'll go with uh a band from sweden and this is a a swedish death metal super group that's had a a lot of different members throughout the years uh band called bloodbath this is their first album was released in 02 uh this is resurrection through carnage uh this band is um it's jonas and anders from catatonia and uh martin axenrot from opeth and originally michael ackerfelt from opeth was on vocals 
uh, Dan Swano, legendary uh, producer and musician in the Swedish scene, was also involved early on. Uh, uh, per Erickson was in the band for a while doing on guitars. He's uh, currently in Ghost. He's one of the ghouls. Um, wow. And a uh, bunch of other guys. Uh, the uh, second album, which is this album, this has uh, the Hypocrisy lead singer on it. Uh, Peter, I can't remember his last name, but Hypocrisy is also another Swedish death metal band. And then this is their newest album. This has uh, Nick Holmes in the band from uh, Paradise Lost. So he's the only non-Swedish guy, I think, to ever be in the band. He's uh, Paradise Lost from England. And uh, so this is their newest album. Just came out in uh, 2022. Uh, this is Ooh. Survival of the Sickest. Um, really cool shit. Like if they're uh, obviously Swedish, so they pay tribute to the old Swedish death metal bands, but they also combine it with Florida death metal. So those are my two favorite death metals. <laughs> and uh, you get this. So those are my two favorite uh, cuts of steak. Exactly, hundred percent. You combine them together. Uh, this is their second album I show, but this is Nightmares Made Flesh. Uh, really cool record too. Um, they've got like six albums. And I own these three. I will be getting the rest as I go. Uh, I did want to play a little bit of... This is their first show they ever played. Uh, so it's really cool. Uh, this is uh, Vakken 05. And this is their first uh, live appearance ever. And it, this fucking set is so cool. Like the crowd gets so into it at the set. This is like an hour long set. I probably watched the set like four or five times the last week. Like, it's just literally all my favorite things in death metal combined into one. Like, my favorite guitar tone, my favorite drum feels, my favorite vocal styles. <laughs> like, it's just basic, good fucking death metal. And uh Yeah, it's really cool. Really cool to play Vakken as your first live show together. No, for sure. Obviously obviously these guys had played big shows before, but not as this group, so Yeah. Do they tour? Uh they have they tour a little bit. Because all those bands are very busy. Yeah. Like Catatonia is a big touring band, Paradise Lost from that Nick's in, they're a big band. Martin Axenrot, the drummer, he's kind of not in the band anymore, but he was in Opeth, got kicked out. So he's obviously touring with Opeth a shit ton. Yeah. So tours are few and far between. Yeah, they, there's a crowd shot in here where the whole crowd is just headbanging. It's fucking cool as shit. It sucks. Michael Ackerfeld doesn't do anything with death metal anymore. It's really sad. Like, Opeth has nothing about death metal anymore. Yeah. He doesn't even really talk about it anymore. Doesn't want to talk about it. And he was so fucking good. Trying to find that one shot. It's really, yeah. yeah. That little shot right there. Like the whole crowd's just headbanging. Yeah. Is that technically corpse chain or what? No. No, this is wearing blood. 
The band's called okay. Bloodbath. Yeah, it's I got it. It's probably just paint to look like blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Just really good groove, death metal, good riffs, good clean vocals. This sounds really good. Like, this sounds almost like it's fake. Like, it sounds way touched up. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's fucking really good. Oh. Anyway, Bloodbath. I could listen to them fucking all day. <laughs> it, cool. It's just like everything everything I love about death metal. Last yeah, like, man I'll talk about. I was going to say, okay. like, if they tour, it'd be cool. It'd be, it, it might be a, a des- another destination show for you. Oh, yes. If that ever happens anywhere close by, yeah, um, I will I will definitely, definitely want to check them out. Because that's, that's another one that it's like, yeah, you're probably never going to see it again. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's just impossible to get all those guys together on the same page. Yeah, they, they, the schedules are not, a, they're, they're not possible. All right. My next one, my last one, finish it off for the night. This has been a long one. We've gone Magnaflow bonus time <laughs> and then some. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little band called the night flight orchestra. Ooh. So this is, this is their newest album. 2022. Oh, wow. This is air. This is aromantic Two. Uh, cool thing about night flight orchestra is they are more Swedish guys. So this is uh, Bjorn and uh, one of the other dudes from Soil Work. Uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, it is Bjorn and David from Soil Work. And they did this band with uh, Charlie D'Angelo from Arch Enemy. So those are the big names in the band. And Soil Work, Arch Enemy, uh, two big Swedish mellow death bands. So similar bloodbath bloodbath went the other way and just played more heavier death metal. Um, this band is a tribute to AOR. It's a tribute to uh, ELO journey, like the AOR style. Yeah. Uh, so like album oriented rock, uh, like journey foreigner, uh, kiss, Ario Speedwagon, super tramp, ABBA, very disco influenced, um, here's their first record, record, uh, internal affairs. Got that on CD. I um, dig the, I dig the, uh, the aesthetic, if you will. Yes. Uh, this is actually a redone artwork. Cause this album originally came out in 2012. They got signed to nuclear blast and nuclear blast re put this back out uh, in 2018. Uh, here is skyline whispers. Uh, sometimes the world ain't enough. I dig it. And, and then uh, Aromantic. This was 2021. No, 2020. Aromantic 2 just came out last year. I like this artwork because it reminds me of Bioshock. 100%. That's yeah. that's the only vibes I got from, the, from most of it is is because the uh, yeah. the font and the, the font and the glow of the font is very Bioshocky. Yeah. Um. So they put this band together. The cool thing about this, I'm on it. I'm pretty sure it's either Aromantic or Aromantic 2. It's either this one or the second one. They actually use the drum kit that is used on ABBA's Super Trooper album. It's the Ooh, same kit. That's very so, cool. Uh, very cool. The production style is very much the same. So it's a bunch of death metal guys getting together and playing a bunch of like, you know, pop rock, 70s pop rock, basically. Uh, I'll play a little bit of a song here that I absolutely love called The Vinyls. Uh, this is off of, uh, uh, dang it. What's it off of? I'm trying to remember. Uh, let me pull it up here. Oh, it's aromantic. It's off this one. So it's off that one, but let me pull it up here. If you're into anything that I just said, this band is for you. So, like I said, if you're into any type of 70s, disco, classic rock stuff. Their videos are always sick, too. They always do such a good job. So, very cool, very, like, airy, light production. Very 70s. Let me 
and get a little bit of the vocals. That's Bjorn, the lead singer. They're really fun live, too. I watch a lot of live videos. They're another band who doesn't really come here or tour. Yeah. They do a lot of fests in Europe. They do a lot of, like, big metal fests, and they always end up stealing the show. Yeah. Like, I always read comments, like, you guys are the best band. Just like, I didn't even know who you were. Stole the show. Yeah. Just very fun 70s vibes. This is all up my alley, 100%. I, I was in on it on the first record. When the first record, Eternal Affairs, dropped 2012. I was like, yep, this is definitely for me. And I followed <laughs> along off and on yeah. throughout. And then we, when this topic came up, I was like, yeah, they instantly came up. And I, I started diving back in. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. This is a cool song, too. White Jeans. It's a funny video as well. Jeans, white jeans, white jeans. <laughs> this song will be stuck in your head for like days. Yeah. I'll show you a little bit of live footage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do, like, they do a really cool live footage live show. They have uh, uh they have really cool backup singers. This is Bloodstock uh 2022, so big metal fest. Uh they ended up they were like one of the headliners on the fest. Yeah, it's just a really sick band, dude. I would have never expect like a bunch of Swedish death metal guys would be doing this stuff. Yeah, it's like um, uh, it's foreigner in there too. Yeah, it's definitely foreigner. This is one of my favorite tunes. This is uh, if tonight is our last chance. This is a cool ABBA. This is the ABBA keys. It's funny because I was never a soil work, dude. Yeah, I, I barely know anything about soil work at all. I just know they exist, really. Yeah. I was never really an arch enemy guy either. And that's basically the, yeah. the bands that formed to do this. Yeah, really cool, man. Are you with us so far? Are you getting the Abba vibe? They're the type of band that you go see and you don't know who they are, and then you just start having fun by the end. And yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Like, Holy shit, that was awesome. <laughs> no, yeah, it's they're they're definitely yeah. the the fun uh, like a bring you into the fold fun band. That's yeah, that's yeah. Fun. I dig it. Um, <sighs> that's yeah, it. I, that went a lot long. I could talk about Night Flight Orchestra forever, though. They're fun. No, yeah, no. I, I dig the I dig the aesthetic. I dig the vibes. I I like the videos. I like that. Um, yeah, I uh, 
I, I, the same way, I would not expect that sound out of those people given their primary jobs, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I honestly think Arch Enemy is still really big, but I honestly think that's kind of becoming their main thing. I could see them being really big, like ghost level ish big. Interesting. Um, I think if they got like a TikTok <laughs> thing going. I think it could be very... If they got uh, memed, if they got memed, if they had the thing going on, we'll see, yeah. Yes, 100%. We're working on it. You guys gotta get, you guys gotta get memed. That's Sorry. That's, that's, come on. Um, I, don't, I, don't here. I, don't make, I don't make the 2023 20, musicals here. You gotta, you gotta start memeing. So you gotta start getting some riffs going, some memes, some, some lyrics here and there. You gotta get yeah. memed. And then once that happens, then you start selling out stadiums, okay? Sorry. Yeah. Because I think they have the, they've got that gimmick but they got that retro thing that people like right now. Oh yeah. You know, uh, you know, it's not as like overtly gimmick, like ghost, like this, like Satan is a med draws people in and shit. But like, uh, I think, uh, I think if they got on a good package with somebody and toured around the States, like I think they could actually become pretty, they could become bigger than soil work for sure. And potentially even bigger than arch enemy. <laughs> What's <laughs> interesting is, here is like, I don't know, like, you know, more than I do. Like, I think the European metal audience is different than the American metal audience. I don't know if the American yes. metal audience would appreciate them the same way that the Euro audience would. Like, they were on a tour with, like, because like they were playing Metal Fest. They're, it's a whole day of heavy, heavy shit. And then Night Flight takes at the end. I don't know if the American yeah, yeah. would be appreciated the same way. Um, No, I don't think they'd be in a package like that. Okay. But I think if they got on a tour with Ghost, they probably know all the Ghost guys. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. I think if they got on a tour with Ghost, or uh, if they opened like even some like seventies or eighties bands that are still touring, like if you got on like a Sticks tour or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they could be exposed to a whole new audience. Like get yeah, the boomers yeah. in. Gosh. Get the boomer. If you get the you get the boomers, and then you get the memes, and then Those you get on TikTok. Money. That's good business. And that's it. That's how you make the money. That's, that's the how you make the money, money right there. Yeah. Because <laughs> the so, boomers yeah, spend the money, and then the TikTok kids will stream you, and they'll meme you. Yeah. Buy that's a t-shirt. How you do it. There you go. Yeah. That's how you do I, it. That's fun. Oh, man. Anyways, guys, this was a, a long one. This might be our longest episode. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll see when the when the nut, when the nut cutting time comes. So yeah. this probably won't do good in the algorithm, but so Not be well. it. This is a fun one. I yeah, love yeah, yeah. diving into this stuff that I hadn't listened to in a long time. So I appreciated the topic. Yeah. If you made it this far, you might as well hit the like button. You've sat here for two and a half hours or whatever long it is. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. We're building a small but mighty community here. Comment down below. What are your thoughts on these side projects? What do you have? What are some of your favorite side projects? We'd love to know. Sound off in the comments. And uh, if you made it this far, you get a special treat because we always choose the topic. You always choose the topic for next week's episode at the end of every episode. And then uh, tonight is my choice. And I was going back and forth on some options. Um, I think I just want to kind of do a big one. Uh, maybe not another like three hour episode, but uh, um, I'm thinking, let me go, let me go to my list, but I'm thinking favorite slash best uh lead singers lead vocalists front men front women wow whatever you want to do so so not we did lyricists uh yeah. we did guitar players did. so i want to do like front men or lead, lead singers i think i'm in that vibe right now i'm or in it I can, I can do that. whatever the the women are welcome as well so um so yeah and then why obviously their voice whatever whatever Bring, bring something. Uh, yeah, and try to bring maybe a record or something you haven't talked Big about. Big package the... guy, personally. Are you? Oh, like, yeah. the, like the total package? No. No? No, I'm talking about, you know. Not, not Lex Luger? No, not Lex Luger. I'm talking about, you know. You know. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Oh, that's like idea. the, like the cucumber that. down the pants. Yeah, but I don't like the real stuff. That's why Robert Plant, not on the list. Sorry. Oh, Sorry, okay. Bob. Sorry, Bobby. Gotcha. It's definitely not. But Robert Plant's not on there, but uh, D. Snyder will definitely be on your Ooh. list. Ooh. He's got a, I'll, he's I'll, 
plug on him. I'll end the video immediately. <laughs> so, Santa yeah. will go kaput. I'll nuke it from the internet. Great. Great. <laughs> oh All righty, guys. Well, we've been sitting here for five hours because we did some other stuff. We'll see you next time here on the Living Dead Wax Podcast. Peace. Thank you.